this, the Wednesday, May 6th, 2020 regular meeting of the NAGSET Board of Commissioners is called to order. If you would please first join me in a few moments of silence. Now, if you will please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, the next item on our agenda is the adoption of the agenda and a motion would be in order. I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Okay. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Um, the next item on our agenda is public comment. Um, and we have three pieces of public comment to read this morning, which I will read uh, into, the, into the record. Uh, this is from Dan Hudson, a NAGSED property owner. Way too much attention has been paid to projections and models which have been inaccurate. Open up and give continued guidance to seniors and those with pre-existing conditions to stay home. If people don't feel safe, they can choose to shelter in place. Otherwise, it's time to get the economy back on track for those who are ready to work and those who want to live normal lives. Government all over the country is now overreaching. Let's roll. The next item is from David Bragg. Good morning. I have additional comments on each option, but will limit my comments and make a summary statement. Since I was not able to preview the results of the meeting that took place on May 5, I would only say the following. Unless that meeting resulted in a net zero cost or net gain for the town for the recycling program, then the contract should be terminated. The town should focus on providing essential services to the residents and visitors during these financially difficult times. Recycling slash incineration of garbage are not essential to the town of Nags Head. The funds saved should be used to ensure that police, firefighters, or any other valued town employee would not be furloughed, fired, or have their hours reduced during the budget shortfall. The can has been kicked down the road long enough, and a final vote on this matter should be taken today. Thank you. Uh, and this item is from Clint Sorrell. Good morning. I'm emailing to help drive the opening of Dare County, North Carolina to visitors as soon as possible. For many families, this is their one getaway for the year. With all of the stresses put on people this year, many need this getaway. Dare County, North Carolina remains the one or one of the only beach counties to not allow visitors. People who frequently utilize the beach know it's not difficult to maintain six feet from other people at all times. With all the additional measures in place at retail stores, I'm not sure why Bear County is preventing visitors at this time. Please open the county to visitors. Thank you. Uh, we also have this morning at this time the proclamation declaring May 10 through 16, 2020 Police Week. Whereas the Congress and the President of the United States have designated May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day, and the week in which May 15th falls is National Police Week. And whereas the members of the Nagshead Police Department play an essential role in safeguarding the rights and freedoms of the residents and visitors of the town of Nagshead, and whereas it is important that all citizens know and understand the duties, responsibilities, hazards, and sacrifices of their law enforcement agency and that members of our law enforcement agency recognize their duty to serve the people by safeguarding life and property, by protecting them against violence and disorder, and by protecting the innocent against, against deception and the weak against oppression. And whereas the men and women of the Nagshead Police Department unceasingly provide a vital public service, and whereas each of us should take the time to reflect on the ultimate sacrifice 
Sergeant Earl Murray Jr. made for the town of Nags Head on May 15, 2009, and the rest of the officers that have done so nationwide. And let each of us keep their family, friends, and all fellow officers in our thoughts and prayers. Now, therefore, the Nags Head Board of Commissioners calls upon all citizens of the town of Nags Head and upon all patriotic, civic, and educational organizers to observe the week of May 10 through 16, 2020, as Police Week, with appropriate ceremonies and observances in which all of our people may join in commemorating law enforcement officers past and present, who by their faithful and loyal devotion to their responsibilities have rendered a dedicated service to their community, and in so doing, have established for themselves an enviable and enduring reputation for preserving the rights and security of all citizens. Therefore, we do hereby proclaim the week of May 10 through 16, 2020, 2020, excuse me, as Police Week and call upon all citizens of Nags Head to observe the 15th day of May 2020 as Peace Officers Memorial Day in honor of those law enforcement officers who, through their courageous <clears throat> deeds, have made the ultimate sacrifice in service to their community or who have become disabled in the performance of duty and let us recognize and pay respect to the survivors of our fallen heroes. This, the sixth day of May, 2020. Having heard that uh, proclamation, a motion to adopt would be in order. Motion to adopt. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Mayor, if, a, <clears throat> if I may. Yes, absolutely. I would just like to ask uh, the public and the members of the board to keep the Murray family in their thoughts and prayers. This is always a difficult time. As you know, May 15th is actually Peace Officers Memorial Day, just like the proclamation said, and that was the day that Earl was killed. Um, usually, uh, Tim, his wife, and the kids are in D.C. Um, during police week, and they're with other police officers, members of our own department. This year, that's been canceled uh, because of the pandemic. So I know that it's going to be an extremely difficult time for, for Kim and uh, the, the girls. So I just ask that everybody keep them in their thoughts and prayers. Great. Thank, thank you, sir. And I was going to say thank you for your past service as thank well. You. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the consent agenda. Uh, you see the items there before you um, and have seen the backup. So a motion would be in order. Motion to approve the consent agenda as presented with thanks to the clerk for clarifying the minutes from the earlier March. Great. Thank you. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda are public hearings. Good morning, Mr. Lighty. Good morning, Mr. Merrick. At this time, we will begin our first public hearing. Uh, the first public hearing is one to consider a text amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance that has been submitted by a property owner to expand the principal sale items from outdoor stands to include reservations and tickets for events and activities. We'll begin the public hearing with the presentation of the staff's analysis provided by Planning Director Michael Zena. Good morning, Board and Mayor. Uh, this is a text amendment brought forward by a property owner. Uh, that would be Kate Creef on behalf of Outlets Nags Head. Originally, the proposal sought to amend the UDO to allow for outdoor kiosks for the sale of tickets and reservations uh, for both on-site and off-site recreational activities, uh, such as fishing excursions and, and the like. Um, after coming before the planning board, working with staff, ultimately the text amendment evolved into uh, an amendment of the products available for sale from outdoor stands. Uh, outdoor stand provisions have been allowed uh, since 2009. Uh, where it started with fresh produce stands. And up until today, it only allows for produce and, and certain food sale items. Uh, but we felt like that was the most appropriate um, provision to amend in the ordinance uh, to allow for this. And so uh, Mrs. Kreef submitted a revision of the original amendment to allow for uh, stands to also sell reservations or tickets. Um, so the amendment before you, and, and let me share my screen and I can walk through that uh, briefly. Uh, 
and I've used a different people from the past. <coughs> So, background on our on our Is everyone able to see my uh, screen now? So. What I've provided to you is the adoption ordinance uh, submitted by the applicant. Um, the highlighted portions are what staff's recommendation and ultimately what the planning board's recommendation entailed in terms of um, additions to what the applicant was proposing. But essentially they were again proposing to add reservations or ticket sales as a allowable item to be sold from outdoor stands. Essentially, um, these are allowed in, in the C1 and C2 or districts, and um, you're allowed one of these on a site, on a shopping center or a commercial group development site. Uh, there are approximately 11 properties in town where this would be eligible for. But the applicant uh, generally was asking, again, for reservations or ticket sales to be added, but also that two outdoor stands be added um, what we recommended, what staff ultimately recommended is that uh, two outdoor stands could be allowed, but there would be an exception that only one of those could be used for food products to be sold. So we clarified that um, in our recommendation. And we also established uh, under 7.76.3, we recommend establishing a, a minimum or excuse me, a maximum square footage for that stand of 150 square feet. And under 7.76.4, we recommended that um, the limitation, that there be a time limitation on stands for reservations or ticket sales. And then finally, um, we also provided for the amendment of the definition for outdoor stand. Uh, again, the planning board recommended uh, at their meeting on February 18th, uh, unanimous support or unanimous recommendation based on staff's recommendation uh, for adoption of these amendments. And um, if it's uh, appropriate, I'd turn it over to, to Kate Kreef to answer any questions or provide any additional information. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here. And on behalf of Outlets Next Head, we ask um, the Next Head Board of Commissioners to consider approving our proposed amendment to expand the list of items allowed to be sold from outdoor stands to include reservations and ticket sales. Uh, the request for a reservation stand came to us actually last fall. Businessmen had teamed up with several charter boat captains in the area and he was interested in um, providing a, a space for um, displaying fishing uh, photos and um, talking about in, uh, taking reservations for um, inshore and offshore fishing trips. Well, we love the idea and we think it would be a great opportunity to enhance our offerings at the center. Uh, this allowance could also apply to events, ticket sales, or, or uh, recreation, other recreational activities, uh, tours perhaps. So a uh, lot of things that would appeal to our shoppers. Um, when we started the process, our goal was to enhance our customer shopping experience and increase their, what we call dwell time at the, at the center. This dwell time um, keeps them here shopping and spending more money. And we think there may be some of our customers who are not so interested in shopping and would prefer talking about fishing. So that would um, definitely increase our dwell time and help sales. Um, of course, we had not anticipated the state of affairs we find ourselves in now. And so more than ever, we need to find creative ways to help increase revenue for our stores and our center. And that would be a step in that direction for sure. Um, it would also boost sales for those local businesses that would benefit from these reservations and ticket sales. So we uh, uh, thank you for your time and consideration and happy to answer any questions anyone has. All right, are there any questions for Ms. Creed? 
Thank you. Thank you. With the kiosk, and you mentioned other events, would you have a coordinator, just then this is a curiosity question, would you have a coordinator that would work with all the people that were interested in doing it, or are you limiting it only to, say, fishing? I know you mentioned other events, but do you have a plan for that? We were just planning on the fishing to begin with, um, but if that didn't work out, um, we actually heard from the local businessman he'd had a heart attack and prior to the pandemic. And so we're not sure he's actually gonna be able to do anything this summer, but we were thinking, okay, if this passes, perhaps something like the Lost Colony um, called them, and this was before they canceled their, their show. But in the future, something similar to those type of events, um, we're open to talking to anyone who's who's got those those um, events available. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I have comments at a certain time. I have no question of the applicant. Questions for Mr. Zener before we proceed? May I? May I? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, Margaret, you said about 11 sites could be affected. Does that about mean 11 sites? Yes, sir. I'm happy to name which sites we believe those would be. Um, and, and, the, and the 11 sites you're about to name are available for a 150-foot kiosk, either mobile or fixed, correct? So we believe today uh, that these sites as shopping centers or as uh, group development would be eligible today to have a, a, an outdoor stand and therefore would be eligible um, for any uh, stand that's under this modification based on the ordinance amendment. That would be, all of those would be able to have two stands if they chose to have two stands. Correct. Under, under the proposed ordinance, they could have one stand that was dedicated to ticket sales or reservations and another that was uh, either for produce or uh, some type of food sales. And you know why in 2013 the planning board staff and board of commissioners turned down the request? For two stands when it was asked? It was my understanding that, that there was um, objection to generally to the allowing two food stands. Um, I think it was more related to uh, the allowance of multiple food stands, maybe not as much to allowing multiple stands. I, the dynamic of considering something being sold other than food was not a question at that time. So it, it was generally the focus on additional food items being sold and any competition that that may add. The food stands aren't limited to just food. They can also sell other products that aren't food right now. That's correct. Which, includes, to, which, includes, which includes tickets or to events or whatever. So as I've, long as it's immaterial or subservient to the principal use. Yeah, I apologize. I'm trying to find the exact language. Bear with me one second. So the allowance in the code is that the sale of any other items shall be incidental and limited to no more than 10% of the display area or 10% of the sales. So that, yes, you're, you are correct. Hypothetically, someone with a food stand could sell tickets or reservations as long as they complied with those limitations. Thank you. The rest of my comment I'll hold till when we discuss the item. May I for Commissioner Fuller one thing? Back in 2013, it was an attempt to protect some brick and mortar establishments because there was a big impetus by people outside of the area coming in and setting up their wares to sell food. And that impetus is still occurring today at a state site. I understand that way. And there was no desire to have 
everybody coming in from outside to undercut people that are paying the taxes. Are there any other questions for Mr. Zener? Anything else, uh, Michael? No, sir. Thank you. Anything else from the staff at all at this point? Um, did the commissioners wish for me to, to name the locations where we believe this could occur? Uh, I don't see why not. Go, go ahead if you don't mind. Sure. So that would be uh, Central Square, uh, where the Antique Mall is located, uh, Gong Coastal or Caribbean Corners on the causeway, the Outlet Site, the Croatan Center, Surfside Plaza, Jockey's Ridge Crossing, Pirate's Key, Nags Head Plaza, the shops at Ten and a Half, South Beach Plaza, and uh, the TJ Maxx Staples Shopping Center. Uh, the village would not be included, so that would exclude the Outer Banks Mall. Thank you. All right, at this, at this time I will ask staff whether you have received any comments from members of the public uh, to, to put it to the record at this time. No. Does the board wish to receive any other information about this um, proposed text amendment before taking action? If not, we will conclude the public hearing at this time and the board may deliberate on this proposed text amendment. I know you. I'm going to start on the other end. I know you start there. start there? All right. All right. Whip? Um, I'll be happy to. Um, I'm going to speak in opposition to the approval. I know it went through the planning board staff, um, planning board and staff. But when I look at it, I think there are a number of things. First of all, it appears that a service is being requested. Well, that service already exists. I mean, for years, numerous places have been selling tickets on site for other events. The primary and principal one to look at is the Lost Colony. I mean, numerous businesses have always sold tickets for the Lost Colony. Um, another great example is Kitty Hawk Cakes, Kitty Hawk Sports. They sell tickets to off site events all the time. So, if you're looking at it from what the request is in terms of a service, that service exists, it's legal, it's permitted already. Um, so I see adding another 150 square foot structure to an existing site, which we have 11 of, as being nothing more than adding another sign. It's just a sign. It's not providing any more services than we already have. And so it's an opportunity to provide signage for something, whatever that may be. Um, and I guess I look at it that these things could become very carnival looking in how they are. How they, are. they don't have to, you know, there's no restriction on paint or how they look. I mean, there is some in terms of if it's mobile, it's got to have siding, et cetera, et cetera, but it can be a fixed thing. And I think they would be put where, as, as any vendor would want, they'd be put where they'd be most visible. Um, and so I'm not sure that we, or at least that maybe we don't know the full effect of what these will do, but it's not providing any new service. And I just see it as another possibility to create more signage that I don't think is what we're after right now. Um, I think that's probably enough to be said. I think that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. Mr. Burton. You know, we got an email back on March 1st, March 1st from Barbara Gurley uh, in reference to this. And she had put some uh, questions in there about whether the proposal actually enhances the shopper's experience. She talked about increased traffic and pedestrian activity. Expanding approval from one to two just opens the door for future expansions. 
and the possibility of trash and food debris in the parking lots is both unsanitary and unsightly. And I'm looking at this, I think that the sites that we have now, which is the produce stand at Austin Seafood, that has been there for a, a number of years, and then we look at I look at the hot dog stand that operates near Ace Hardware. Mm -hmm. um, I have not seen, uh, but as a citizen in my previous professional career, any issues or incidents with uh, pedestrians being impacted by the increased traffic, nor have I seen trash, increase in tr trash. Um, as far as enhancing the shopper's experience, I don't know if it actually enhances. Maybe the ladies are in shopping and the men are looking offshore fishing trips. But um, as I stand here now, I don't see a concern. I don't share the same concerns as Commissioner Fuller. Look at it as an opportunity for folks that may not experience the Outer Banks in the way that some others do, give them the opportunity that they may not come across. And I agree with uh, Commissioner Brinkley. It, it's this, uh, the Outer Banks Mall, and it's sitting in their general courtyard, and it's back all, It's not even going to be out on the street. You're not going to see it. The Antique Mall is going to be inside. You're not going to see it. So signage is going to be for people that are already at the property, already in the property. It's not going to be signage out on the street. So I don't have an issue with it. I have a couple of questions. One is it says it doesn't really say where it's limited to. It gives you an idea. But in any case, could it go into a parking lot and take up parking spaces? You want to have Mike White answer that question? Please. Michael, did you hear that question? I did. Um, so referring to the current code, so currently an outdoor stand, uh, when located on a site with 50 or more existing parking spaces, no additional parking spaces shall be required. When located on a site with less than 50 parking spaces, a minimum of three off-street parking spaces uh, in accordance with the parking regulations shall be provided. Um, they can be located in a parking lot. Um, bear with me one. There, beyond that, there, there's no limitation on where they can be located on the site. It, it has to meet principal structure setbacks, but beyond that, it could be located in a parking lot if there was uh, excess parking, minimum parking allowed or required. Secondly, the limitation on signage of the structure, on to the structure. So there is a maximum allowance of one temporary sign not to exceed 15 square feet. Attached to or detached from? Um, I believe the, the way it's written in the code, I believe it's required to be attached to the structure that it can't be a uh, temporary sign mounted on the ground. Okay, thank you. Yes. Mike, that follow up to that question, is that signage standard above and beyond what the calculation for the shopping center would already be? Yes. It, it, it's not counted as part of the maximum allowed for the shopping center. Thank you. I, I'll express a, a reservation. I, I don't have a problem with the, personally, I don't have a problem with the function. I don't have a problem with the function being added under existing canopy, uh, which I understand perhaps may have been the original request and maybe the intent here. Um, and I don't, I, I don't have a problem with the current ordinance of one freestanding you know, having a freestanding um, 150 square foot or 400 square foot um, uh, uh, farmer's market type stand. We do have reservations about adding a second freestanding unit out in the parking lot where we're already permitted one. And I think about some of those shopping centers and where they're located and having the second trailer added to that parking lot bothers me to some degree. 
visually. They wanted to keep the one that they're permitted and have this additional function under the canopy as a as a use. 150 square feet of the boardwalk and do that at milepost 10 and a half or Tanger or where you know up on the deck. I, I don't don't have a problem with that. I do have some reservation about the second route the parking lot. Um, so. Um, any other questions then for staff or any other discussion? One last question, Tim. And it says that it must be removed every day. Not, am I misreading that? Michael, did you hear that question? Um, currently, hot dog, coffee, ice cream, and Italian ice and fudge stands may be operated year round, but shall not be left on the property overnight and must be removed daily. So produce stands and these types of stands, at least under the amendment, the proposed amendment, would not be required to be removed daily. And they can exist year round. If it's a hundred foot, a second stand, it could it, it could stay there year round. It doesn't have to be open, but the building can be there. No, sir. The um, oh, excuse me. Um, presumably, yes. It it could be a, a structure that was essentially permanent, yes, sir. But they cannot operate um, for a period of, of time not to exceed 180 days annually. That leads me to one more question. Okay. <laughs> Any hurricane construction standards if it's going to stay there year round and not be moved? I would suppose it would need to meet the building code requirements. Um, I'd have to defer to the to the chief building official in terms of what those requirements would be for a structure of that size. But I think it would make sense that it would be at least uh, tied down and secured. One of Austin seems to be. That one does, yes. But yeah, I think it has a mood as far as I'm at. Just a ticket kiosk makes me wonder. Right. Would it be built? Would it be? Right. You know, I'm there all the time like that. I understand. I've taken precautions. Anything that would be constructed, I'll offer anything that would be constructed and require a permit would have to be. If it was going to be framed to meet that standard. They want something to keep out. Number one, three. Any other questions? You made a vote. Did you modify that to say that the signage has to be included in the the overall signage, so no additional signage would be, if you've got 32 square feet, you can't have any more than 32 square feet of signage. Can that be done, Michael? Uh, hypothetically, I'd have to go and um, look at that particular section of the code and come up with some appropriate language um, to amend that. We had not um, we had not included that in the ordinance previously. The shopping center, no parking requirements and no use of parking that would lower what the parking is required for that shopping center. That covers everything you want. Well, I think I'm going to get back to what the mayor said. If there's a kiosk in the middle of the, like, I don't know what the name of it is. I'm going to say Tanger. Um, but Tanger, there's a place there that historically has been used that way. And I don't, I don't have a problem with them selling tickets or doing stuff there. My issue is what is being proposed is the allowance of 11 additional 150 square foot buildings that could be placed anywhere on the property. Um, and, and when I say signage, I think they would use the kiosk at the kiosk as a sign, not the signage on the kiosk, but the building itself will be used as an advertisement. And I'm not sure I'm ready yet to look at Meg's head when I'm driving down the bypass to see and we're only talking about between 
what I call the Nagshead food line, which is not the village food line, but the Nagshead food line and whale boat. So we're talking about 11, six miles. So we're talking about two of them every mile. He actually took that to TJ Maxx. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, to TJ Maxx, but six or seven miles you got, you would have 11 of them, which averages out a little less than two mile, two per mile. Um, and what, what could happen? I'm just talking about if we allow it, then that's what we're allowing. The original request, which I think was to sell a ticket at a site, I thought was already permitted anyway. Um, and this doesn't do anything to prohibit people from selling tickets for an event or an activity in existing facilities. So, but what's being proposed is adding more building square footage that I, in fact, look at more as a sign to attract more people to a place. I don't know if that makes sense to anybody other than me. Well, so, um, and I, I, I understand that, that argument. Separately to the request about uh, potential modifications to this, uh, Michael, if we, or the attorney, um, somebody speak to me about the procedure. If we wanted to, if, if we wanted to consider a vote on this with a modification, uh, a clarification on the parking and limiting the signage further, um, understanding that that may not address one commissioner's concerns, but that that may be an issue, can we make that modification here? Um, can we move that modification here? Um, and pass this or, or take a vote on this or do we need to ask that it be modified approved by the planning board and brought back to us? I think based I'll on the dis I, sorry. No, I was just gonna add, just based on the discussion, based on what I've heard, you can refer it back to the planning board based on the comments that you've made, you know, with respect to signage, with respect to the location, with respect to the to the number of of these I think it may be appropriate to refer it back to the planning board to consider those items and, and to return back at a future date. I, I agree. I'm not opposed to the concept. Um, what I, in the conversation and hearing the comments was that maybe it's perhaps the location on the site that seems to be some discussion and perhaps making sure it's not right out on the street kind of thing. We only have a five foot setback in some cases, especially for emergency. Oh, yeah. Right, right, depending right. on where you are. Eight feet, 10 feet, whatever. But perhaps it's the location that needs to be modified. Um. So if I can sort of summarize then, it, it sounds like uh, I'm saying that this perhaps is not the full consensus, but that there are some modifications that you've heard, uh, some additional considerations about the visual impact of these on the site, signage and parking. Um, and so perhaps it would be appropriate for another run through the, through the planning board with that feedback um, and bring this back to us. And so I would ask if there's a motion, uh, if anyone wants to make a motion. I'll, I'll make a motion that I think is easy. And I don't mind it coming back, but I just make a motion that we deny the request as presented. That motion doesn't mean something else can't come back to us. It's just that I'm just saying that we deny what has been presented. Second to that motion. May I add, would the motion accept friendly second amendment? Yes. With the stipulation that it go back to the planning board for further review and recommendations to come forward. Absolutely. I have a motion and second. Any further discussion? What? 
you ask the question, what does denialment do? If we're asking them to read, to, to look at it again, what does the effect of us saying that we denied as presented? What does that do versus just sending it back to them for, for modifications? Just out of curiosity. Well, I, as a, I guess one effect would be that if the planning board did not include any signage or uh, other restrictions that have been discussed here, uh, but instead recommended that it come back as originally presented, you would have already taken action to deny. So, I think I think the, the motion is to deny it form, but to ask the planning board to consider these additional features, which I assume means it will come back to you with some provisions for further consideration. The reason why I ask is that I'm, I agree with the uh, getting the planning board to look at the other thing. I'm not, I don't agree with Denying that that's just I do agree with getting the planning board to look at what we talked about. Okay. I will say this if, the, if this motion is, is uh, does not pass, another motion that would be appropriate would be to table the matter and refer it back to the planning board for consideration. That would be another thing that would not have the effect of the denial, but would probably accomplish the same thing. Um, with the second or er, Agreeing, I'd just like to remove my motion from the table and ask that somebody else make a motion that may be more appropriate. Thank all for essentially what you said. Motion. Can we just table the matter and ask for, or, or I'm sorry, give guidance to the planning board to look at the concerns that have been expressed here in this meeting? And return to us with a revised with, um, with a revised I mean, amendment with a revised uh, ordinance. Ordinance. That's your motion. Is there a second? Okay. I have a couple of seconds to that. So, any further discussion on that motion? You know, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you. Delighted. Item two. Yes, sir. <clears throat> This time we will conduct another public hearing. This one is to consider a text amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance to correct identified errors. Um, on this one, I understand that uh, the staff's presentation will be provided by uh, Holly White. Good morning, Mayor and Board of Commissioners. Um, I am happy to share this um, text amendment with you today. Um, since the UDO was adopted in August of 2019, staff has been documenting a number of minor um, punctuation, grammar, consistency issues that are um, in the UDO and tracking those. Uh, this amendment is to correct those identified errors. It's essentially housekeeping. Um, and it's anticipated that staff would continue to, to do this periodically um, in the future. Uh, staff would recommend that um, the amendments be adopted as outlined and that uh, at the planning board uh, unanimously supported this at their February 18th meeting. Thank you. Are there any questions for Ms. White? Um, just Quick question. There are no substantive changes, correct? No, no, no um, substantive issues. Numbering and look. Clarify. Because I didn't see any substantive changes, but I wanted to make sure that there was no substantive change. Any other questions for Ms. White? That's good. And all the proposed changes are highlighted in red. Yes, that is correct. Any further questions? Commissioner Brinkley, Commissioner Sears? No, sir. Mayor? No. May, may I uh, just pull it? Yes, sir. 7.33.4 eliminate, is eliminated. And that is not a substantive change. Correct? Um, there, this is actually a conflict. Um, there was a, in the parking section, um, it also referenced a, a different 
standard for accessory residential units, um, which is one per unit instead of using the N minus two. And so we're referencing that existing parking standard um, rather than 7.33.4. So it was no longer needed. So which is more restrictive? Oh, I'm sorry. I was muted. I apologize. Um, the one being struck, 7.33.4, is more restrictive. So, in that case, it's my opinion there are substantive changes being made. So, let me, if I could jump in here, this is Michael. Um, so, the change was made as part of the UDO to the parking requirement for commercial with accessory dwelling. And well, um, I would agree that this is more restrictive. There's an inconsistency in the code and we understood the intent in the adoption of the UDO uh, with respect to commercial with accessory dwelling was to require only one parking space per unit versus using the methodology for the single family units. Um, so the intent here was to correct a discrepancy or a lack of consistency between the two provisions. If I understand that, that's what the whole thing is. My question originally was, is there any substantive change? And the answer was no. But then when I asked about this, this is a substantive change. I can understand why you, you may be correcting something may be correcting something, but it's still a substantive change. I can understand that perspective. Are there any other potential substantive changes? In my opinion, no. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Zener or for Ms. Uh, Ms. White? <clears throat> Anything further from staff? Time. Has staff received any comments from members of the public on this proposed text amendment? I, I see that there are none. All right, does the board wish to receive any other information regarding these uh, proposed changes before you deliver? If not, at this time we will conclude the public hearing and the board may Consider this proposed series of amendments. All right, Mr. Sears, I won't make you start. This <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mr. Kitty. Okay, all right, great. Uh, hearing none, then a motion would be in order. I'll make a motion we approve this as presented. Okay. So a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. <clears throat> aye. Opposed? Thank you. One more item, Mr. Lighty. Yes, sir. At this time, we will begin the public hearing to consider uh, numerous text amendments to the Unified Development Ordinance as pertains to the updated flood maps and uh, an update of the flood damage prevention ordinance. We'll begin, I believe, with an introduction of this matter by Planning Director Michael Zinger. So thank you. I've got a <clears throat> PowerPoint that I'll go ahead and start. <clears throat> Mayor, if I may, before we start, I'd like to disclose that I've had a conversation with an interested party about this um, in terms of me listening, not discussing the proposed ordinance, but listening to concerns from outside people. Thank you. Mayor, I'll, I'll just point out this is a legislative matter, not a quasi-judicial matter. So the fact that uh, members of the board may have received information about this prior to today's hearing does not in any way preclude their participation. So, Mr. Fulbright, uh, as long as you're still biased, it can be fair. Um, uh, biased and partial, <laughs> you can still participate. Uh, I will attempt to be. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, Michael. 
Thank you. Um, <clears throat> good morning again. So we're returning to the board with a proposed draft uh, flood damage prevention ordinance uh, updated to be consistent with the map update for the FEMA uh, flood insurance rate map update for Dare County. Um, we last went to the board or came to the board to discuss this, I believe on March 4th, uh, which would have been following a March 1st, uh, excuse me, a, a I'm losing track of my dates, excuse me, a March, um, a February meeting, joint meeting between the planning board uh, and the board of commissioners. Uh, we then held a community information meeting after that March 4th um, meeting with the board of commissioners, um, which was fairly well attended, I would say. And then that proceeded to an April 1st planning board meeting where the board considered uh, the proposed ordinance and their recommendation. Uh, as we included in our memo, uh, we heard from the home builders uh, and actually had a meeting with the home builders following the community information meeting. I think it was constructive. I think we understood the perspectives uh, from the home builders and hopefully they understood our perspectives. Obviously there are uh, a couple of points that um, we're not in alignment on and I think uh, we'll present some information there and I think you've received or we've received and I'll read into the record uh, later uh, two letters one from the home builders and one from the Association of Realtors uh, that comment on the proposed ordinance uh, but essentially recapping how we got from uh, how we got to this point so the new preliminary flood maps were released for Dare County in 2016 uh, staff has been working with a committee of county and other municipal representatives on uh, the update of the ordinance and, and information regarding the maps uh, since that time. Um, we uh, were, were different in terms of our LES, our local elevation standard from other municipalities with the exception of Duck, where other municipalities in the county are looking at a eight foot LES. Uh, some have adopted an eight foot LES thus far, uh, but Duck and the town of Nagshead uh, are pushing forward with a 10 foot LES. And we believe there's good reason to do that. Uh, the last update of the maps was in 2006. Uh, and I think as the board is aware, we're obligated to adopt uh, the updated maps study and, and ordinance um, the maps and study by reference in the ordinance uh, by June 19th, 2020, that is the effective date. So again, this is the, the timeline and, and we're in the uh, end of this with the letter, letter of final determination uh, having been received in December. So we're in the six month adoption period um, and we've been fortunate enough to stay on track with this uh, with a small rescheduling of the planning board meeting uh, due to the pandemic and we appreciate um, the board members um, working with us on this, but also members of the public and especially the Home Builders Association representatives. So uh, I'll turn it over to Holly uh, White and she can go through the specifics um, with regard to the maps as well as the proposed ordinance. You're on mute. Okay. <clears throat> Can you guys hear me? Yes. I think I think we're good to go now. We're just coordinating here um, with this new technology. So as Michael indicated, um, this is, has been an extensive process. The planners from all the communities have been working together collectively as, as well as with the home builders for the last three years on um, the flood maps and the creation of the local elevation standard as well as education and outreach information to encourage homeowners to continue to carry flood insurance. Um, and so that information is available on our website. Um, I'm going to review quickly the, the major changes to the preliminary firm maps. Um, overall, there's been a reduction in the properties in a flood zone period. So that means fewer B zoned uh, properties as well as AE zones in addition to 
um, a removal of properties out of um, the flood zone, we're also seeing a decrease in base flood elevations. So the properties that are remaining in AE flood zone are reduced um, to a four or five foot base flood elevation where it had been an eight or a 10 foot elevation. Um, for properties um, in the VE zone, we're not seeing as much of a change. Um, in the past, it wasn't a straight 11 through most of the town. Now we're seeing a range of uh, 10, 10 to 12 foot BFE. Um, probably the biggest change is this addition of an AO flood zone, um, which is new west of the primary frontal dune on the maps. The next few slides um, just depict visually that change in the flood zone. Um, the upper map is the effective firm. The lower map is the preliminary firm. Um, you can see that the, in the upper map, VE is depicted in the lavender purple color, light purple blue, uh, and AE is in the orange. Uh, shaded X is in the yellow. Um, and that was for the northern part of the town. For the um, central part of the town, there is a change mostly to Pond Island. You'll notice that the VE zone has been um, removed from Pond Island in that map. Um, and in the South Nags Head area, there's not as much change to the actual flood zones, but rather you see a decrease in the uh, base flood elevations was more of the impact in this area. So the town is required to update its flood damage prevention ordinance along with adopting um, new preliminary maps. Um, the standards generally for AE and VE zones are largely remaining the same as they are today. Um, there are ordinance requirements that we are required to adopt as part of updating for the state model ordinance. In addition, probably the most major change is with the creation and adoption of language that supports the local elevation standard. Um, next, I'm now going to go through each of these uh, individually because they're not uh, significant, but these were the comments, um, very minor comments from the state after they reviewed our draft ordinance. Um, probably the most significant one is just to clarify the date of our um, pre-firm map um, in, in the um, definition itself. So with the creation of the local elevation standard, as I said, we had uh, collectively worked with Dare County and the other municipalities to do this. Um, and basically, this is just a locally adopted elevation level that's going to be used as the regulatory flood protection elevation for properties in all flood zones, and that includes um, X flood zones. Um, this is important, and I think staff um, supports this local elevation standard because we have documented rainfall events. Um, rainfall based flood occurrences for the past 20 years and have seen an increase in the frequency and intensity of these rainfall events in Nags Head. Um, there have been significant rain, rainfall based flood events um, have been documented in, in the town 11 out of the past 20 years and more importantly every year for the last four. Um, Hurricane Matthew was documented at a maximum flood elevation of 10 feet mean sea level and areas of um, additional areas of rainfall related flooding were documented in Vista Colony subdivision me measuring as much as 11.25 feet. We've also seen numerous other small scale rainfall events that have resulted in flood depths that exceed uh, eight, eight feet mean sea level. So the overall benefit of this local elevation standard is that we are proactively regulating based on no known historical flooding to avoid future losses and risk to property. Um, there's also a benefit to encourage homeowners to build up to avoid any type of future insurance increases. The local elevation standard can be best defined geographically for areas east of NC12 and SR 1243. Um, we would implement a 12 foot local elevation standard and have um, that area uh, adhere to the VE construction requirements very similar to today's standards. For non-oceanfront areas that are west of NC-12 or SR 1243, um, we would be looking at a 10-foot local elevation standard for all new construction. Um, we did analysis to support this and uh, the analysis indicated that 85 
percent of the 5,277 structures in NAGS have, ha have an estimated first floor elevation of 10 foot or greater. So how specifically will the local elevation standard affect properties in NAGS head? Um, we've reviewed just generally the elevation requirement. Um, again, for areas east of 1243, they would be treated as a, a V zone, um, 12 and 1243, excuse me, with no enclosures. And for areas west of 12 and 1243, again, it would be treated as an AE, and we would be looking at limiting enclosures to 300 square feet or less. Um, for existing structures, um, areas cannot be converted for temperature controlled space unless you meet the regulatory flood protection elevation. And in addition to general, the general standards that apply across the board for shaded X and X zone properties, there are a few other standards that we've looked at um, putting in place. First of all, um, that substantial improvement or damage in this shaded X and X zone does not apply. So we wouldn't be tracking the 50% rule um, for these properties. For lateral additions that are west of NC12 and SR 1243, um, we would be looking at allowing a lateral addition to be increased by 25% at the same level um, without having to be elevated to the RFPE in place. If it exceeded that amount, then it would have to meet the RFPE. And we would allow um, in this shaded X and X zone area, remodeling and renovations within um, existing habitable area as long as the footprint, so the, the footprint of the structure does not increase. The following few maps are showing the existing ground elevations in Nags Head. Um, the areas in the blue are seven, uh, eight foot and below. Um, this is in the northern part of Nags Head. Eight to nine is shown in yellow. Uh, nine to 10 is shown in orange. So you can see a large part of the northern portion is um, below the eight foot elevation. And most of the west side neighborhoods are 11 feet and above. Next up is the central portion of Nags Head, which is largely um, also eight foot and below both on the east and west side of uh, Croatan Highway. Next slide. And in South Nags Head, again, you can also see that um, eight and below is represented by the blue area. Um, the areas where you see white are actually the dune ridge near the ocean front and those areas are 13 feet and above. As I mentioned before, we did um, some analysis to support kind of the, the creation of the local elevation standard and the 10 foot and 12 foot um, elevations. There are 19% um, of the, st the structures in the town have an existing FEMA non-compliance issue. And there would only be a 3% change um, in that with the proposed local elevation standard. Of the 1,178 non-compliant structures, only 78% 70, uh, of those um, would be non-compliant. 78% um, of the non-compliant structures will be within an X flood zone, and that would be for the LES of 10. And so this is significant because this would allow those 78% of structures without, or without an LES to build on grade. And in these areas, these properties have ground elevations below 11 feet. Staff um, prepared a, an example of uh, looking at how a lateral addition might work. Um, this property is located in between the highways and Nags Head and was built in 1972. Um, the lot, the ground elevations in this area range 6.5 to 6.7 feet with a first floor elevation of 9.7. Uh, their existing lot coverage is at 16.9%. Um, and that leaves the potential for 16.1% of lot coverage to be uh, available in this area. So we did uh, looked at the first floor area, which was around 768 feet. A 25% addition to the structure um, would be 192 square feet um, potential addition. 
And with the remaining, um, the available coverage minus maybe the coverage for the lateral addition, that would still leave 1,624 square feet of lot coverage available. So staff um, believes that having this not, not allowing um, lateral additions just to be regulated by lot coverage is not enough and that we need to cap the area uh, allowable lateral addition to 25%. So assuming that we had a LES of 10 and without a limit on lateral addi additions, approximately 622 of existing non-compliant structures would be el eligible to maximize lot coverage. And today um, they are not currently precluded from doing so. So in closing, um, the overall goal of the National Flood Insurance Program, as well as the Flood Damage Prevention Ordinance, is to protect human life safety and health, as well as to minimize damage to public and private properties. And we feel that the regulations proposed in the ordinance are consistent with these goals. And moving forward, um, we have to adopt these maps uh, by June the 19th. Um, that's all I have at this time. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Questions for Ms. White. Um, I'll start. I, I have a question. Holly, can you go back to the example that you had, um, the, the house on the lot, um, where you had the 25% limit? Uh, okay, so if there was if there was no limit to what could be built below the 10 foot elevation standard, other than 25% or some other arbitrary number, then theoretically, they, I would hope nobody would do this, but if you didn't have a limit, they could theoretically add they have to add some parking so they can't use it. So that they could add 1,800 square feet of lot coverage. If they add bedrooms, they're going to need to add parking spaces. So they wouldn't add that much in closed space and septic. So, you know, as opposed to being able to add 192, maybe they can add 500 or 600 square feet of building if we only left in place the lot coverage standard. They're not gonna use all of that space for building because they're gonna need some for parking. And they're going to potentially, in some cases, bump up against, depending on what they're doing, bump up against their drain fee. That's more of an observation than a question. So I'll, the question becomes, where'd you come up with 25%? Tolerance is the question. Okay. And why? I mm -hmm. her reasoning why, but at the same time, if you, if you do that, you limit that person that's been in that house since 1974, who might want to add on 10 feet to their house or 25 feet to their house for that other room. But if you add on and make it a four bedroom, now you gotta have a four bedroom septic with a four bedroom septic repair area, plus another parking spot, you can't max it out. What you're forcing folks to do is to tear that old house down and max it out. And then you end up with what you've got on Soundside Road, which is completely to the borders, as tall as you can make it, as big as you can make it. And nobody wants to see that. Mayor? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, I think I know how Doug arrived at 25% at the end of a very long meeting. What I want to know is how Max had arrived at 25%. Tell me where it came from. So I'll, uh, I'll respond to that. Um, basically, originally we had discussed 10%. Um, I think staff's concern was that without any limitation, properties now in an X zone um, would be able to perform lateral additions um, without complying with any LES requirement. And as Holly referenced, it's approximately 692, I believe, properties that this would 
effect, it meaning that currently those 692 properties, they cannot perform lateral additions such as this. And under the new code without a limitation such as this, they would be able to. And I think it's concerning to staff um, that these are structures that are currently below uh, their current BFE, their current base flood elevation. Um, these, excuse me, these are structures with floor area currently below their BFE that can't make that lateral addition today and they would now be able to. But when we were reviewing this, we felt like um, they are now in an X zone. Um, we should make some accommodation for a minimum allowance um, below the LES to allow them to make a lateral addition. And originally we started out with 10%. Um, and then we learned that Duck uh, was proposing something similar and they were proposing 25%. Uh, we had conversations with the home builders and they at least believed that, uh, I think they would say this, I think their point was they would prefer there be no limitation, uh, that it be up to lot coverage, but they obviously preferred um, what Duck was proposing at 25%, uh, better than 10%, felt like it afforded more flexibility. And, and I think we ultimately decided that that wasn't an unreasonable request based on some analysis that we were doing in terms of looking at pre-existing conditions. But the intent of it is to allow for lateral additions of existing floor area that may be below the LES. So someone can do a uh, perhaps a small <clears throat> um, increase of a bathroom or a bedroom. And it's important to point out that it, it doesn't preclude someone from making a larger lateral addition. It just requires that that lateral addition beyond that 25% be elevated to the LES. Um, and I, I, so I think that's something that we would see, we do see today where someone makes an addition and they comply with the BFE and they would be similarly subject to comply with the LAS. Today, a property that is in the AE that has floor area below the base flood elevation couldn't do this today. And I think we were attempting to react to concerns that we've heard from uh, the town's board members, planning board members, as well as Board of Commissioners about a concern about the accuracy of the maps and whether or not the maps um, with their zones as located geographically afforded protections to the town. And I think it's simply that it's a reaction to that concern, whether or not we want these 692 approximately properties that currently cannot do this without um, complying with a base flood requirement to be able to do these lateral additions uh, and not uh, be limited in, in, in some way. Question. Michael, since we are in a data-driven mode throughout the country today, and we should be no different, um, and that modeling is only as good as the amount of data that's entered into them, when the state emergency management did the models for the flood map, they included enormous amounts of data and drove it straight straight to the ocean front pretty much unless the sound front with just very few models inputted. Um, so with all the amount of the data inputted into the ocean front, how did you arrive at 12 foot on the ocean front? When that, if you looked at the number of scenarios entered, it doesn't prove itself on the flood maps. So currently the, the requirement along the ocean front today is a 11 foot um, elevation requirement. Uh, so with a freeboard of a foot, that would be 12 feet. So what we're proposing is essentially consistent with uh, today's requirements. I think, um, you know, I think we are all conscious about uh, increased rainfall events and storm uh, and climate change and sea level rise. But I would say in this effort, what we're proposing here is, is essentially to continue the status quo. Um, you know, I think we believe that at a base level, the existing maps afford us with minimal protections uh, in the face of changing conditions. And I think from a minimal standpoint, 
we would recommend what's proposed to carry forward at least the status quo. To do anything less than that, to, to look at an LES of eight in the town versus an LES of 10 would not be um, recognizing our geographic conditions in the town and our flooding conditions that affect the town. So the, the proposed uh, LES of 12 maintains the status quo along the ocean front. I don't disagree, and I was not talking about the town as a whole. I was only specifically referring to the ocean front because that data appears to be truly the one aspect of the modeling that turned out correctly because that's where they drove all the data inputs. Um, if you look at the number of scenarios that they entered, it was hugely increased into the ocean front, less on the sound front. That's why we ended up with such bad data sound front versus ocean front. Um, so I still can't get an answer as to where we got the 25% um, data driven. Sorry, I, I think I can't come from ducks. Like, like I, I say, I know where the duck number came from. It was thrown around tons of numbers at the meeting that they had and at the end of the e a long evening, the 25% was just a suggestion thrown out, quickly adopted, and that's where they went. How did NAG's head on its own independently arrive at 25%? Yeah, so I, I would tell you that, again, and, I, and I'm sorry if I'm not explaining this as clearly as, as you might like it, but the, the, we originally came up with the 10% as a, as a reasonable allowance for an expansion of existing floor area, recognizing that the vast majority of the properties that we're talking about are currently non-compliant. It would be precluded from doing any addition, uh, lateral addition that's below uh, the BFE or below the LES. Um, I, I would say there's no, there was no data, no science that came that allowed us to come up with the 10%. It was myself, the deputy planning director, Holly, the principal, uh, principal planner, uh, our chief building official around in a room and, and discussing what would be in a reasonable allowance, recognizing that allowing someone to maximize lot coverage was likely unreasonable and uh, not a, probably not a, a supportable idea in terms of public safety, considering that these properties can't currently do that expansion. What's reasonable to allow someone um, an expansion? What's a reasonable limit to allow someone to expand existing floor area? And we came up with 10%. The reaction to that uh, from the home builders, the reaction that we heard from them was that they preferred it be limited to lot coverage, but we didn't believe that that was a, a, a starter because of uh, the impact that that would have on those 692 properties, potentially. Uh, and we believe that, that you know, what Duck is proposing at 25% was not unreasonable. And, and I think referring back to the slide uh, that Holly presented, I think, shows how um, expansive or, or, or limiting that would be um, and again would not preclude someone from elevating out of that um, and meeting the LES. It's the measure of reasonableness, not a, not a not physical standard. measure, not a standard. Another question. I know that um, sea level rise was mentioned earlier in this room and also know that sea level rise was given as a measurement standard in duck. Um, sea level rise study was based on a hundred year floodplain kind of thing. And the one of the there's a range of values, and the top range was a meter over a hundred years. So if we look at a 30 year plan, that's only a foot. Where did we include that foot into our calculation or did we use the three-foot based on a hundred-year study. So we actually didn't base what we're recommending on on sea level rise data. We again base what we are recommending on geographic conditions in the town, uh, flooding conditions that have occurred over the last uh, five years at least, and um, actual flooding flood heights. And so they, they were not, what we're recommending was not similar to duck. And we understand that because um, the home builders also raised that as a point and a question for us. I think the assumption was is that our greater LES of 10 than what other communities were considering was 
similarly based in sea level rise data to duck. And when we explained that it wasn't, when we explained that it was based on existing topo topographic conditions, existing flooding conditions, um, I think they at least understood that. Um, whether they agreed with it is obvious that, that they don't necessarily, but it was, they, our recommendation was not based in sea level rise data. Well, I do know that sea level rise is going to impact us on the west side a whole lot sooner and more violently than it's going to affect us on the east side. Um, through subsidence, sea level rise, whatever you want to call it, we're already seeing the effects of that due to the increased flooding, not just from rain events, but from all types of storm events. So I guess I'm, in my mind, I'm just struggling with the 25% as being an arbitrary number. And uh, I'm not sure that that's in my mind. There are other limitations that will come into play. Michael, I was going to ask Holly, but when you put together all of this, did you consider any of the data being inflated for flooding based on the fact that failing or failed infrastructure that has caused problems that we have been in the process for the last three years fixing? I, I don't know. Um... I don't know that that was taken into consideration in terms of infrastructure impacts that uh, relate to flooding, but I also don't know that that's something that we necessarily can depend on or control. Uh, that's another outlet or another lever that um, certainly there needs to be decisions about. And, and I think um, studies and, and, and outcomes that need to be seen in, in terms of the positive effect um, before we would want to make regulatory changes that were uh, that were based on that. I, mean, I, I think that would be my thought is um, we would need to see some positive outcome before we would react to that from a regulatory standpoint. I think um, I think we would and just referencing uh, Commissioner Cahoon's comment, I think we would generally agree that we're concerned about uh, flooding impacts more on the west side neighborhoods and you know, that is why we are proposing the 10 foot LES versus an eight foot LES. Um, essentially, if you, we were to regulate an eight foot LES versus a 10 foot LES, properties on the west side, um, there would be 1900 properties regulated less stringently than they are today. And so if we're concerned about greater impacts and not lesser impacts, um, I think the 10 foot LES, um, is more warranted than, than looking at the eight foot LES. And that's maybe I'm you know, responding to the earlier question, but I think it's important to put that in the context of uh, the comments from the home builders as well. So with going with the 10 foot LES, how are you gonna regulate building height and would that increase the overall um, view shed of all the buildings that are being built moving forward? No, I don't believe it would. Um, again, it's generally maintaining the status quo. Um, a 10-foot LES, um, again, only regulates, uh, I believe, 174 properties more stringently than today. So potentially, you're talking about, you know, 174 properties that may be able to, to build slightly higher. We're talking, you know, no more than five feet, I could imagine, in, in each circumstance uh, than they could currently. So I, I don't believe that would be the case. The majority of the properties that, you know, in the west side neighborhoods um, are currently have elevations um, greater than, than eight and nine feet today, if not, you know, at least in the northern sections, uh, 10 feet and greater. So you shouldn't see any impact in those neighborhoods. And uh, the majority of the others are currently in an AE zone that would require them to be elevated um, currently. And, and this is, again, trying to maintain the status quo. Is it correct that your 10 foot to the bottom of the floor joist would change if you put an HVAC duct that would at that point have to be 10 foot above? That, that is correct. One of the, the pieces of this is that we are establishing a, a reference level so the, the LES of 10 uh, essentially results in a, in a top of floor, top of first floor of 11 feet. Um, and 
so that that is accurate. Um, we've talked about that with the home builders in terms of how that may come into play. Um, and, and talking about that in a, in a real world example, let's say you have um, an existing property with a, with a, a grade of, of eight feet. Well, they're gonna likely add two feet of fill to that site to build on grade. If you've got a property uh, that has an elevation of, of six feet, they may add two feet of fill, but they may choose not to, but we know that they're probably going to elevate that structure regardless and get above the 10 foot LES uh, to accommodate that headroom in that uh, area under the house. So um, we think the, the reference level is important to, to be aware of that it does establish, you know, that the area below the floor, uh, the structural members and, and other elements. Um, but regardless, those would today need to be flood proofed anyway and or elevated uh, for properties that are in a in an AE. So um, we, we, we think it's not much of a change in that respect. Uh, just sort of a follow up. Um, obviously, if it's eight feet, you're talking about finished at nine, talk about 10, finished. 11. Um, that's understandable. But the, the question I really have is, as a group, everybody in Dare County met and came up with eight foot except duck and Nags head. I for one, well, I do care about duck, but I for one care more about Nags head. Um, how did Nags head come up with 10 as opposed to the eight that everybody else did if we're all working together? Yeah, I would, I would tell you, you know, obviously we all have different geographic conditions in each of our communities. And uh, I think different regulatory conditions based on even the existing flood maps. And <clears throat> I, I, I would tell you, I would not be in a position to comment on the appropriateness of eight in unincorporated Dare County or Kill Devil Hills or Kitty Hawk. Uh, just like I would hope that they would not be able to comment on the appropriateness of, of 10 feet in the town of Nags Head when we're more intimately involved with our flooding conditions and our geographic conditions. I think ultimately, again, the 10 foot LE, LES, and, and I can refer back to uh, the PowerPoint, um, was really focused on real world flooding conditions that we had seen, but also geographic and ground elevations, topographic conditions that we had seen. And um, I think ultimately coming up with an LES on the east and west sides of 12 and, and 1243, hopefully simpl simplified it. You know, we weren't then concerned with locating a particular flood zone on the map. You just needed to know where your property was located, um, simplified it, and then hopefully uh, again, we were not attempting to be more onerous than the current maps, and we were definitely not attempting to be less onerous than the current maps. And I think that is borne out in the fact that um, the LES of 10 only creates 174 structures that are non-compliant, um, 174 additional structures that are non-compliant with that LES. Uh, versus an eight foot LES uh, would create approximately 1900 structures that are less uh, regulated than they are today. Uh, so I, I honestly believe that we, we at the 10 foot LES, we, we hit the sweet spot in terms of matching what our current regulations are. Did that house flood that you're using as an example, has it ever had water in the chart? I, I believe it has. I'm, I'm receiving, you can see it as well. Holly's shaking her head yes. We're still, I believe, in the question and answer phase, yes, not the debate phase yet. That's exactly right. Um, so, any further questions for staff? There are none, uh, Mr. Mayor. I would ask staff uh, about any public comments that have been received regarding this uh, proposed settlement. 
Sure, I, I received uh, two letters this morning that were sent yesterday evening uh, from the Outer Banks Association of Realtors. And um, let me share my screen and I'll read those into the record. They requested that I read them into the record. So uh, I don't know that they, if they'll make comments as well, but let me go ahead and um, bring those up. So the first letter is from the Outer Banks Association of Realtors. <clears throat> Dear Mayor Cahoon and NAGTEC commissioners, on behalf of the more than 1,200 members of the Outer Banks Association of Realtors, thank you for your work to prepare the town of Nags Head for the June 19th effective date of the 2020 flood insurance rate map. Our association recognizes that the flood damage prevention ordinance before you today is imperative to mitigate the hazards posed by the 2020 firms under representation of area flood risks. We thank Nags Head planning staff for their diligent attention to community input as the FDPO has taken shape and appreciate the town's efforts this morning to minimize the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on continuing stakeholder inclusion. OBAR has carefully monitored both their county's FDPO process in the development of analogous ordinances in six local min municipalities. We have noted that NAGSIP proposal differ from Dare counties in two important respects. It's establishment of a 10-foot regulatory flood protection elevation in areas west of NC Highway 12 and its requirement that certain lateral additions in existing properties in X and shaded X zones meet the RFPE. OBAR remains concerned with the negative impact on NAGS head property values that these two elements of the draft FDPO would induce if codified and with the resulting implications for our members. When selling, home, when selling houses, realtors have a responsibility, responsibility to disclose non-conforming uses of properties, especially as may limit those properties value. Consistency in local building regulation minimizes realtors exposure to liability and other complications arising from this responsibility. OBAR therefore welcomed Dare County planning staff's initiation of countywide discussions intended to inform development of consistent local RFPE standards. As these discussions were necessitated by the 2020 firm's revision of the prevailing eight foot standards, the 2006 firm delineated their expectable conclusion uh, was that local ordinances would be developed to preserve administration of the prior standard. These discussions culminated in Dare County's codification yesterday morning of an eight foot X and shaded X RFPE at a revised reference level for enhanced mitigation. As the NAGS heads draft FDPO demonstrates, these discussions did not, however, result in consistent observation of an eight foot X and shaded X standard among Dare County municipalities. Because the proposed 10 foot RFPE and lateral additions compliance threshold would limit potential buyers ability to expand and thereby enhance the value of their homes. Nags head draft FDPO would complicate realtors disclosure obligations and potentially undermine the marketability of affected properties. <laughs> Due to the foregoing concerns, OBAR respectfully requests that commissioners critically evaluate the necessity of the proposed 10-foot RFPE and corollary elevation standard for lateral additions in excess of 25% of the existing adjacent floor. Should these standard lack, standard lack express justification by historical flood data demonstrating eight-foot compliant properties susceptible to damage to conditioned space, we strongly urge uh, omission of these standards from the codified FDPO. Thank you again for your work to support the Resilient Outer Banks. Regards, Porter Graham, Government Affairs Director, Outer Banks Association of Realtors. And let me bring up the next letter. Uh, this being from the Outer Banks Home Builders Association, uh, dear Mayor Cahoon and NAGSEC commissioners, thank you for your leadership as your community works to maximize its resilience by revising the flood damage prevention ordinance in preparation for the 2020 flood insurance rate map, uh, June 19th effective date. The over 500 members of the Outer Banks Home Builders Association appreciate the complexity of the task before you and welcome the opportunity this process presents to us, uh, presents us to apply our professional knowledge and service to the town. We are thankful for Planning Director Michael Zayner and planning staff's responsiveness to our members' recommendations as the ordinance has developed in recent months and are confident the text before you potentates sound solutions 
uh, potentiates sound solutions to the challenges the 2020 firm poses for construction and development standards. We remain concerned, however, that the FDPO as currently written is problematic in two important and interrelated applications to X and shaded X zones. Its establishment of a 10 foot regulatory flood protection elevation and its restriction according to square footage of same level lateral additions to newly non-conforming properties. OBHBA members and local surveyors and engineers initiated an FDPO working group in 2017 to assist local planning staff in designing new flood prevention measures to address an anticipated reduction in the 2006 firm's flood zone elevations in Dare County. Extensive consideration of historical flooding, previous firms, and topographical data informed a consensus among working group members and county and municipal planning staff that administration of administration of an eight of eight foot standards to a revised reference level, the bottom of the lowest floor utility would ensure adequate protection, flood protection in AEX and shaded X zones and achieve regulatory consistency throughout our community. Section 11.42.3.1.2 of NAGS Head's draft ordinance proposes instead a 10 foot RFPE for AEX and shaded X zones. Throughout the working group's efforts, Neither NAGS head staff nor available flood data indicated the inadequacy of an eight foot standard and advisability of, an, of a 10 foot standard. While we recognize that each jurisdiction must determine RFPEs and other important planning objective, objectives on localized bases, the OBHBA urges the commissioner's attention to the potential consequences NAGS head's proposed 10 foot RFPE poses for new construction and for existing homes in light of additional proposed restrictions on lateral additions. Section 11.44.2.7.9.2 would require that lateral additions to non-conforming structures in X and shaded X zones be elevated to the proposed 10 foot RFPE if they would increase the square footage of the adjacent floor by 25% or more. This presents a problem for homeowners interested both in usably enlarging a floor that falls below the proposed RFPE and in maintaining a floor level, a level floor. The OBHBA respectfully requests that commissioners allow existing maximum lot coverage restrictions to regulate additions and remove the arbitrary 25% threshold for lateral additions in X and shaded X zones. We believe that the category of possible lateral additions that would expand properties with a demonstrated flood history that would conform to maximum lot coverage and that would be large enough to constitute a compelling regulatory interest is almost vanishingly narrow. We believe that the size of the lateral additions to the many, many moderately sized homes in Nags Edge should not be rigorously constrained by regulation with such a limited intended function and should instead be limited only by existing zoning regulations. We strongly urge your consideration of these requested revisions to the Nags Edge FDPO text before you today. Thank you again for participating in the Outer Banks community cooperative uh, community's cooperative endeavor to ensure sustainable building and for your efforts to include stakeholders concerns in your dialogue. Regards Vaughn Robinson, President, Jay Overton, Legislative Chair, Porter Graham, Government Affairs Director. Uh, uh, I will, are there any other comments uh, from members of the public that the staff have received? Not that I'm aware of. All right, does the board wish to receive any other information regarding this matter before you begin deliberations on it? Remember. Go back and say some. Porter Graham and, and Jay are on, on here. They are. While we've read their letter, they may also want to make comments or at least. Is there a way that they will notify us? That Do you have any additional comments you would like to make regarding this item? Uh, very quickly, I would. Um, first of all, I would um, I would really like to thank staff uh, and, and Nags Head as well as uh, staff throughout the county. Um, 
y'all may or may not be aware, but uh, throughout our discussions in North Carolina and some of our discussions nationally through the home builders, um, it has been, com comments have been received back how unique it is and how impressed others are with our Outer Banks community and the fact that we could come together as uh, municipal uh, leaders and business leaders and work on a flood prevention ordinance like this for almost three years where everyone um, has been working diligently to do what is best for the community and we, we found ourselves um, you know, uh, striving to, to put forth something that would uh, would work for some time to come and you know that's just a, a situation that uh, uh, the, the feedback has been that that we're very fortunate to live in a uh, community that we all can work together like this um, with regard to the couple of items that, that we've put forward in our letter with regard to the reference level and the uh, lateral addition um, I think that sometimes it becomes hard with the data that we have when we go and we look at the maps that we can utilize from Dare County and other sources as far as ground level and uh, the existing finished floor that that all is good information but when I look at a map and it's telling me that I've got an existing elevation on the first floor of a 10 and now I'm looking at a reference level that's going to be the top of the girder or the bottom of the, the lower structural member, there could be almost two feet of difference there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm a little concerned that we're going to be creating some situations that were well intended, but because of some of the differences that we're dealing with the, with the reference level, we may be finding that we're, we're, we're putting more on our uh, property mm -hmm. owners than, than we intended. Um, we're restricting use of their properties um, in ways that are much more than what we were intending. When we look at the lateral addition, uh, that all comes about based upon how we pick this reference level. And if the, the reference level and the measurement, um, if, as that moves, that impacts the number of properties that fall into this. So um, I, I would ask that uh, in y'all's consideration today, if it's possible, then um, adoption or action on this could be delayed until your, your next meeting or, or possibly as, as far as your uh, meeting the 1st of June. So that it would give us the opportunity that we could all come back together and, and talk about this a little bit more. I know uh, our, our hope and intentions were to have more discussions about it, but with our, our current situation of how we're limited on people coming together in groups that has uh, really hinder that, but, but maybe there would be the possibility that we could get a, a small group together over the next two, three, four weeks and, and look more into this so that we make sure that we're just continuing what we've already been doing for the past three years to make sure that we make good sound decisions. Because we're gonna live with these for the next 10, 15 years, because more than likely that's what we're gonna be looking at before we get another cycle of maps approved. So um, I'm still very concerned about those, those two issues and uh, I would like the opportunity that we can all come together and talk about it in, in much more detail before we make a final adoption of this. And I, I thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak this morning. Good luck to you on the continuation of your, your meeting today under these circumstances. Thank you. Mr. Overton, if you'll, Mr. Overton, if you'll stand by for one moment, let's see if the board have any questions for you. Anybody have any questions, Mr. Overton? All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Overton. And next, Mr. Um, Mr. Graham. Hey, good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Good. I, I just uh, really likewise, um, as Jay indicated, appreciate the town's inclusion of us this morning um, and uh, work to ensure that the uh, prevailing conditions don't um, have any effect on our ability to continue in a, in a stakeholder involved way with the town. Um, and I really want to uh, express on behalf of the Realtors Association, uh, our appreciation for Mike Zaner's uh, continued availability to uh, discuss this ordinance with us as it's taken shape. Um, 
our our view is fairly simple, um, uh, and it's that this whole process was a response to um, the revision of the 2006 flood insurance rate map um, and a reduction of the prevailing eight foot base flood elevation in X and shaded X zones um, and going to 10 or uh, 11 considering the new reference level um, when coupled with the lateral addition requirement would represent um, an additional disclosure responsibility uh, that's difficult for our members to understand, um, that's difficult to communicate to buyers, um, and that's not present in uh, neighboring towns. Um, and it's going to limit the um, uh, improvement of properties and thus the value of properties. And so the Realtor Association uh, believes that we need to ensure um, it's expressly necessary. And that is to say it's indicated by uh, data demonstrating a real risk of damage to conditioned space um, in structures elevated to the, the prior eight foot standard. Um, and that also have room for improvements large enough considering lot coverage requirements uh, to represent a, a compelling regulatory interest for the town in terms of the, um, the flood mitigation mission that, um, that you all are, are taking so seriously, uh, and very appropriately seriously. Um, and we just, we'd like to, to emphasize to commissioners that I know the, you know, the, the June 19th date, uh, feels like it's approaching fast and it feels as though, you know, the, the trains come in out of the tunnel with the light shining right on us, but we certainly don't have to, um, to codify this ordinance today. Um, there's additional opportunities for revision um, and should uh, commissioners desire, you know, additional opportunities to consult staff on the underlying data, um, those should absolutely should be taken. Um, and uh, the, the text should be revisited as Jay suggested at, in, in subsequent meetings. Um, thanks very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Graham, if you'll hang on one moment, let me see if uh, members of the board have any questions for you. Questions, Mr. Graham? All right, thanks, Porter. All right, is there anyone else who has uh, indicated they wish to comment? Anybody from else, else from the public who has indicated they wish to comment or who's participating in this uh, hearing that has indicated they have an interest in comment? All right, uh, Mr. Zener, I think you raised your hand. Uh, something additional you'd like to add? Yeah, I did just want to clarify uh, in response to one of the comments from Mr. Everton, the, the data that we've been providing in terms of the number of properties affected by this we did adjust those uh, data points to account for the reference level. So the numbers that we're giving in terms of the number of affected properties by this um, ordinance in either direction and depending on what the LES is, uh, they do take into account the additional, uh, approximately an additional 12 inches um, associated with the reference level. So uh, I did want to make sure that that was uh, clear for the board and the public. Thank you, Mr. Zener. All right. Does the board wish to receive any other information or have any other questions uh, before you begin uh, deliberations on this matter? A, a question of you. If the board decides to make some change, and I would consider a substantive change, can we adopt it today or do we have to continue? Well, it depends on whether it is a substantive change or not. A substantive change would be one that changes the character of the ordinance, uh, not one that makes significant changes within the major term. Changing the, uh, the elevation level from one measure to another would not be a substantive change for purposes of requiring another public hearing, uh, if, that, if that answers your question. It does. Okay. I will include the public hearing and the board may uh, proceed to deliberations on this matter. You might want to start with comment. I uh, want to encourage to, to, to approve this today in my opinion. Um, I still, even the data that we've been given, I still don't know how we came up with the 10 foot 
that's still a concern of mine. And the 25% the lateral addition, I believe we're, we're handcuffing our property owners. And, and the example that was given was, was an extreme 25% 192 square foot addition. Like my uh, Commissioner Sears said, tear it down, you build a bigger house, max out everything. I, I just, I think we ought to allow block coverage to dictate uh, lateral additions and not, not the 25%. Um, I'll we'll go around. I'll, I'll be happy to go next. Um, I, I actually don't have a problem with the tenancy. Um, I, I'm convinced that staff has has hit on the right number um, with the, with the ten feet. And if we if we decide to hear additional information, and I and I, I don't have a problem with waiting either. But if uh, the home builders and or the realtors uh, wish to present additional information. I'd like I'd like data relevant, comparable to the 174. I mean, the, I'm convinced the staff has done a good job of evaluating based on the 10 uh, foot reference elevation to find the 174 structures. If that number is significantly different, I'd like to see how that number was arrived at. That was significantly different. Um, and, and if it's not, then I don't have a problem with the 10-foot elevation. The 25% the or whatever it is, is always going to be an arbitrary number um, to, to some degree. I, you're, you're picking a number. I mean, to say that if we set a new reference elevation that's higher than the map and nobody can build any square footage, that's not a reasonable answer. If you um, set a new standard, but say go by the map, and if you can add additional square footage up to your lot coverage, that may be reasonable. Although, you know, you're really letting people put, you're letting people choose their risk, which that's okay. If somebody somebody's in an area that's potentially flood prone and they want to add more square footage, then, then, then so be it. I'm I'm a little bit ambivalent about that. I I understand that. Um, you know, somewhere between 25 and 50 is probably a reasonable number, but who who knows? I mean, there's, there's, it, it's a choice, so there's always there can always be an argument about it. Um, uh, Renee, um, my disdain of these flood maps has been evident for years. That's not going to change. Um, I'm not going to argue at all with the 10 foot LES. I think that. Um, as we move forward throughout the next few years, that's going to be shown probably be a fairly good number. Um, I think staff has done a good job on a lot of this flood map stuff. I have two major concerns. One is the LES versus the reference point. Um, that difference of a foot causes me some concern. Um, if you suddenly go from 10 to 11, based well, on that, or 12, whatever it may be. That causes me a lot of concern. I'd like, I prefer us to have a standard and stick to one standard and not have a nebulous thing hanging out there that makes surprise somebody. Um, so I'd, I'd like for us to find some way to either adopt the LES or put a sidebar in it, but I'm not, I'm not happy about a sidebar of increasing it to 11 or 12. The other point is the 25%. Um, you're right, Ben, it is an arbitrary number. Um, and we have sometimes have to make arbitrary decisions, but my arbitrary is not 25%. I think that's too restrictive. Um, and I think lot coverage, among other things, will dictate what can happen. I think some people will try to go above the 10 foot so that that section stays pretty conforming. I'm um, thinking ahead, but there are going to be other conditions, septic, parking, any number of things are going to dictate that that's not going to be they can't max out in a building at lateral addition to 100% left in the house. There's going to be other ground surfaces um, that will take care of that. I think it's 25% is too regulative, and um, I do appreciate the staff time. I would like to see the home builder's data that they've referenced and spent three years on. Um, and see how that was related to what the staff did and came up with their 10%. In most cases, I think the 8-foot elevation is going to probably put you at a 10-foot elevation because 
most builders are still going to have a free board there. So, it's, and I didn't even look at it from uh, a realtor side or, or a builder side coming in here today, reading the letter it, uh, that you that Michael wrote makes a lot of sense. You're going to come off with a 125 foot addition or square foot addition, and then you're going to have to bump up for probably four feet if you want a, another addition. A lot of the character of the Outer Banks, and especially Nags Head, in between the highways is a single family, 12,000, 1,200 square foot house, one level. And you start putting stairs into add-on living space is very restrictive where you don't need to have that. Changes the whole architecture of the beach. Um, I'm tending to agree with everybody. I think lot coverage should be the governing uh, standard. Using an example, um, like with me, I could add a thousand square feet if we use 25%. Uh, one of my family members could add 300 square feet. Uh, I don't need a thousand square feet. A family member probably needs more than 300. So the 25% doesn't resonate well with me. Lot coverage works. I mean, and I think Commissioner Sears is right. We'll end up seeing stuff being torn down and the lot being maxed out. So what's the point? Um, the eight to 10, uh, I, I can go along with whatever the majority thinks is the right. I think you made a compelling argument for 10. Um, I think staff did it find a sweet spot, but I still can also accept eight. Um, I'm not convinced that eight won't work. Um, so I, I do believe I hear a consensus that we all want more information uh, or, or that we're all open to more information um, and discussion and we have time. Um, so what is the, uh, I guess, a motion to table to a future meeting would be in order? Yes. Yeah. No, I'm just, you have time provided you don't make changes that revert it back to the planning board. And I don't know what to tell you what that, what you could be considering that may trigger that. It's just something I think you're going to I think a few questions really are, the two controlling things about the 10, eight or the 25% lot coverage. And from what I heard from the attorney, those aren't substantive changes. Right. So it wouldn't have to go back. Okay. Just make sure you kept it. That's why I wanted to ask that question. Regina, so. I believe, has a, a comment or some information to provide. I uh, just wanted to clarify too, to add to that, you do have time. I think we anticipated uh, a potential second round of the public hearing or discussion at the June 3rd meeting. Um, but it, it would be important to mention that a super majority vote essentially would be required at that June 3rd meeting to avoid a second reading uh, that would need to be accommodated prior to the June 19th effective date. So I think that's important to, to make sure the board's aware of. Thank you. May I ask a further question there? Yes of the attorney, a super majority vote, assuming one person is absent from the board, what is that number? Still requires four. Okay. At least, I'm sorry, at least four. So if you have three people present, you don't have enough to have a super majority. And if you have four people present, it takes all four. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. Mayor? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to make a motion that we continue this until our June First meeting in June. Okay. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Mayor, Let's take a read. Can I make one more motion before we go in? I'd like to make a motion that when we adopt the flood maps, that they be a standalone vote, not tied to any other ordinance changes or anything. We have to approve the flood map. Oh, okay, okay. And I'd like that to be a standalone motion that will not encumbered with something else. Okay. Are you suggesting that you receive a separate recommendation?
recommendation from staff to adopt the maps separate apart from the, the text amendment regarding Correct. elevation changes. And I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on that? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, let's take about a 10 minute recess. Thank you. I, I can. All right. The board is returned from um, from its break, and the next item on our agenda is an update from the planning director, Michael. Thank you. Um, so I provided you with um, my planning director's report. Um, not so long since I provided the board with our last report. Um, I won't go over uh, every item, so I'm, I'm happy to address any. Uh, specifically that the board has questions about, um, answer any questions that the board may have. Well, let's just jump to that. Any questions from uh, board members? No, I don't see any questions, Michael. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Um, item uh, F2 is continuing. Item F3 is continuing to our next meeting as well. That brings us to item G, old business, uh, the Beach Nourishment Coastal Engineering presentation. Cliff or Andy? All right, just really briefly, um, at the last, at actually the March meeting, the board uh, discussed coastal engineering and surveying services. Um, Staff had obviously been through an RFP process to solicit um, proposals from firms interested in conducting these services. Staff did an analysis and a review and recommended uh, two firms, one being uh, Moffin and Nichols for coastal engineering and design services, the other being McKim and Creed for beach surveying services. Uh, at the March meeting, the board uh, authorized staff to enter into negotiations with both firms. Uh, for coastal engineering, the, the board clarified that uh, we needed to bring back all the materials to the, to the board for further review and also to uh, have a presentation from Moffitt and Nickel to go over uh, the services that they offer. So since that time, we have been discussing um, various contract proposals with these two firms. Uh, we plan to bring those back to the board in June. Uh, today, we have uh, Johnny Martin with Moffitt and Nickel. Uh, you received their proposal in your packet. Uh, he is listed as the project manager from Moffitt and Nichols for this project. We also have Brian Joyner, Joyner who would be the assistant project manager for Moffitt and Nichols. Uh, Johnny is in Raleigh and Brian is in Norfolk. Uh, that's where each of their uh, offices are located. And uh, without further ado, I would let Johnny go ahead and begin his presentation. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, really honored to meet with you today and let me get the presentation pulled up. Okay, can everybody see the presentation? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. All right. Well, again, thanks so much. We really appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, work for the town and really excited to talk about the kind of services we can provide and are looking forward to get started. Um, so I'll start off with, again, um, Andy stated that uh, uh, myself and Brian Joyner uh, will be uh, tag teaming this presentation, but we also just wanted to mention some of the key staff that would be supporting this project. Uh, Nicole Vanderbeck being one project engineer who's here in Raleigh. Sam Morrison, who just came to us uh, about a couple of years ago from Great Lakes Stretch and Dock and uh, spent about 30 years with them and sort of led uh, the Southeast Division for a while. So his knowledge of the dredging industry and, you know, what kind of makes them tick uh, as far as what they want to see in bid packages has been a real uh, nice uh, add to our team and really uh, brings a lot of value to our clients. 
And then lastly, uh, Doug Huggett, who I'm sure a number of you know, came to work with us about almost about a year ago now. And uh, he spent about 30 years with the Division of Coastal Management heading up their major permits uh, branch. So a little bit about Moffat Nickel. So we were uh, founded in 1945 to mainly provide coastal engineering services at that time, mainly to the Navy and a couple of other uh, port clients. We've grown, still family owned, privately held. Um, now we're up to about a little bit more than 800 employees, including 700 marine uh, civil engineers and scientists. And our, you know, between our Raleigh, Norfolk, and uh, Moorhead City and Wilmington offices is we probably have about 100 staff in those offices uh, combined. But one of the things that we think about our, that's unique about our team is sort of a pioneering level of expertise, uh, our flexibility and availability that we'll talk about in our proven track record. Um, so here's the team we've uh, compiled for the project. So again, uh, I will be uh, your project manager, assisted by Brian, who's located in our Norfolk office. Uh, but as you can see, we have a number of different staff uh, in these offices. And of course, this isn't the complete amount. We also have uh, subcontractors for geotechnical services, depending on if uh, additional uh, geotechnical or field investigations have to be completed. So again, one of the things we think is unique about our team is we can be a real responsive team to the town of Nags Head. So we've been the on-call coastal engineering consultants for Norfolk and Virginia Beach for more than 15 years. And as I've said, we'll have personnel from uh, Norfolk, Raleigh, Moorhead City, and Wilmington uh, uh, supporting the town of Nags Head. And of course, uh, with Brian being close by, he can be there uh, relatively quickly. So again, some of our specialized experience that I think we bring to the town of Nags Head is, uh, of course, we've been involved with a lot of the state level studies and funding, uh, beginning with the shallow draft uh, inlet study. So we did that study for the state probably now going on, gosh, about 10 to 15 years ago. And it took a while, but that ultimately led to the shallow draft fund, which is used uh, for uh, shallow draft uh, for shallow draft dredging and beneficial use placement. And you know, now with uh, those, the state can help provide roughly two thirds, depending on which tier county you're in, can provide roughly two thirds of the cost uh, with the remainder having to come up with the cost share. Also completed the North Carolina Beach and Inlet Management Plan. There's been two iterations of that. And we're really you know, happy to see that the state now is starting to get up to creating a fund for beach nourishment, as well as uh, providing some potential funds for that. Uh, we know that they put aside roughly $11.5 million to be used over the next couple of years. So we're, we're hopeful that uh, that will continue to grow and move forward once we kind of get through this uh, pandemic. And we also did the North Carolina Turbulent Coin Study as well. And again, I think another thing that's a little unique about us is that given that we've had this experience with Norfolk and Virginia Beach and uh, they being on Chesapeake uh, Bay shorelines, that's allowed us to actually implement some coastal structures, uh, including groins and breakwaters and, and utilize those tools. So we have a lot of experience in actually the modeling uh, and ultimately the construction and building of those types of structures. So in talking with the town, what we are anticipating uh, for task in, in the first couple of, uh, in, especially in the first year, is to oversee and submit the monitoring plan and surveys with McKim and Creed, and McKim and Creed will be contracted directly to the town. Uh, so we're estimating that our cost for, you know, pulling together that data, doing all the analysis and um, uh, reporting it and, and, you know, tracking to, you know, the current engineered beach uh, metrics. Our cost, Moffat Nichols' cost, will be roughly around uh, sixty to eighty thousand uh, dollars. The um, McKim and Creed's cost for doing the surveys that have been done in the past would roughly be around forty-five thousand. And they are working on developing some options that we, Brian, will talk about shortly uh, to see if the town would like to to do those or not. But uh, we we're going to purposely um, sort of lay that out as sort of a, a list of different options that the town may or may not want to do. Um, we also want to, talking with town staff, begin the development of the beach nourishment plan. 
and what we're envisioning uh, to begin with. Just as some initial steps is, of course, you guys have been collecting a lot of data um, and we need to get that and review it and put it into some of our own software modeling packages and, you know, just uh, look at these trends and get an understanding. We're, we're envisioning that that could be anywhere from uh, 50 to $75,000 until we really got, we want to collect the data, see how much there is, and then we could come up with a, uh, a better uh, estimate of that. The, the next item is reviewing the existing monitoring and maintenance plan for the engineered beach uh, and looking at that and getting an understanding uh, of that. We think that that would probably be somewhere in the $25,000 range and looking at uh, the modeling and, and things of that nature could be a little bit more, but we think that that would be a good number for that. And then conducting some initial modeling and develop, developing preliminary estimates of nourishment triggers and looking at hotspot management. Uh, we think that that is, and that's really when we start looking at what kind of, um, how we might alter the current uh, number of reaches, you know, how nourishment decisions will be uh, completed and Brian will go more into that. But we think that that initial modeling and uh, analysis would be somewhere in the $100,000 range uh, could be up to 150 but we'll see once we kind of get a little bit more of a feel of the of the then the the other that you see is then just really building upon that finalizing uh, the modeling to develop those volumetric triggers for the engineer beach and the, the how we manage the hot spots and then the field investigations environmental studies and alternatives analysis and you know what all this is leading to is a sort of a 50-year plan and uh, we will talk more about that here in a minute but you know the the goal here uh, if the town chooses to move forward uh, with this would be to say okay let's go ahead and determine what the sand needs are going to be for the next 50 years uh, both background erosion and storm erosion let's then go out and find material you know, make sure we have that much compatible material that can be utilized. And then what we do, we receive a permit and the EIS then would cover those projects for the next uh, 50 years. So it is, it is doing a good bit of work on the front end, but at least what you've done is, you know, you don't have to read this every time um, that you are going to have a nourishment activity and the approval processes can be a lot quicker. Of course, we also see the with the county communities, especially when it looks at hotspot management and maximizing resources. And then, of course, as projects came up, we would uh, design and implement these nourishment events in the future as well. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to a little bit more detail on the uh, surveying and what we are planning to do with the beginning of the master plan. So with Brian. Great, thank, thank you, Johnny. I'll uh, we'll let you advance the slide in a moment. Um, so as Johnny mentioned, this is, uh, he, kind of, he talked through a number of things about you know, how the plan comes together, how the monitoring comes together, and it's all very data driven. And, and the main form of data is all the data you've been collecting in the past so along, if you see the map on the right of the screen, those lines are the, the transects, the survey lines that have been done in the past. Um, both the previous nourishment and planning of that years before <clears throat> the annual monitoring surveys. And that data is key to understanding how the beach has changed over time, how much volume is in the cross section from, say, the crest of the dune out to where the sand is sort of depth of closure, where sand is not really moving around as much by waves in the offshore. Um, certainly includes the bar in, in the intertidal area and the beach berm. And looking at those volume changes um, is the key to understanding you know, how a system is performing both after nourishment and then planning for the next one. So you've got a lot of transect surveyed. We think for the, um, based on our experience with other master plans, for doing the long-term master plan, we'd like to um, tighten up some of the survey intervals. You notice in the north, north in the north end of the town, um, the survey intervals have historically been a bit further apart than in the middle of the town. And we'd like to put them all on an equal footing and go to about 500 feet um, uh, throughout the town and then tighten up a little bit south down toward the inlet just to make sure we're getting enough resolution to understand what's really going on. 
So that's something we're working with McKim and Creed on, understanding the effect of, of that on their survey price, <clears throat> and then building that data, finding a way to build that data into our um, those first two tasks, Johnny, the year one tasks Johnny talked about with the, the data analysis and vulnerability analysis. That same data would go into the monitoring reports that we'd be preparing as well. So it's one data set used um, both for annual check-ins and for the long-term master plan and permitting. Um, trends we analyze, we, we, like I said, we look at, we look at volume change. Because um, if you just go out to the beach on a given day and look at how wide it is, it's a snapshot. After a storm, it's narrower. After a few weeks, even after a storm, you can see it getting wider again as the, the waves redistribute the sand. But the volume is still somewhere in the profile most of the time. It may be a little further offshore and under the water, but, but we want to know if the volume is still there, if it's moved south. Hey, Brian. Offshore, so that volume thing. Oh, yeah. Brian, can you hear me? This, this is Andy. We lost you about yeah. uh, three or four minutes ago. We had to redial into the, huh. the call. So could you back up a little bit? Um, okay. I think you were talking about the northern part of the town and, and tightening up the transects. Okay. Okay. I'll go back there. Thank you. So to do to, no no problem. So to do the master planning uh, on a equal footing all throughout the town, we want to use equal intervals. So right now the historical transects have been sometimes thousand foot spacing apart, sometimes five hundred feet through most of the town. So we, we're working with McKim and Cree to see about making those all equal at five hundred feet from the north end all the way to the south end of the town. And then talking about a couple other options that that may add value or that would add value if we can if we can work it into the plan. And um, once we get those, we use them for the monitoring studies to understand how the beach has changed over the last year, both in terms of how much volume is in the transect or in the profile and how much shoreline change has occurred. Because that's the people, everybody sees the shoreline change. That's an easy thing to observe. The volume change is harder to observe when you go visit the beach. So we want to make sure we're looking at both of those and understanding the full picture. So that gets us to preparing the annual monitoring reports, which will be presented to, to the town as an understanding of how things changed and, and maybe what the needs are for action for the next year. But then going uh, through the next slide, please, Johnny. Um, but then um, how that fits into the overall master plan is, again, is that vulnerability analysis. The task one is data collection review, which Johnny talked about. The vulnerability analysis is really um, using that surveyed data to understand what kind of storm level of protection do you have at all those different transects along the beach? You know, how how are properties behind the dunes protected from that beach profile or protected by that beach profile from storms? And that's using the same data as the monitoring reports would use. Um, the the big sort of key parts of the vulnerability analysis are again understanding that level of protection. What's your current situation um, as as of the last survey? What's your how does that factor into the plan you had with the previous nourishment and what you were looking for for a level of protection? And then, as I'll get to on the next slide, a little more detail, kind of evaluating how much sand does it take at every point along the beach to give you a, you know, a 25-year return period hurricane level of protection or a 100-year return period hurricane level of protection. It's a different amount of sand. And we, we document that at all those transects, which leads into how much sand do you need to place on the beach to accomplish a certain protection, which then feeds into the longer term thing of how much sand do you need to maintain that over the next 50 years? And, and as Johnny said, trying to match that amount of sand up with the available sand borrow areas offshore. So that's the vulnerability analysis is really trying to establish the numbers about how much sand you need both now and in the future. And so task one, task two would be the year one portion. Johnny mentioned uh, some of the longer term stuff. You can see it on the graphic on the screen, the geotechnical analysis, the coming up with alternatives for future nourishment, permitting, and, and then monitoring plans and, and coordinating with others on um, economics and funding. And that all springs out of knowing how much volume, how much sand you need both now and in the future. So um, that does take a, a bit longer. We've in, in, the, in the past, it's taken us somewhere between four and six years, depending, to get through that entire workflow because it involves a lot of coordination with others and, and time for them to digest and respond and, and move forward. So a little bit more detail on the next slide about um, what that vulnerability analysis, the, the task one and task two look like. Uh, again, I said that we evaluate the volume at transects or beach profiles. So you know, 
if you could look at a specific structure, there may be a transect right in front of that, and you would know you'd have a certain amount of sand protecting you from storms in that profile, um, and, and you'd have a different existing level of protection at a different profile in front of a different structure. But if we evaluate those um, throughout the project area, we can come to some conclusion about in grouping transects together that a certain group of transects needs, you know, 25 cubic yards per foot, maybe uh, probably more than that, 100 cubic yards per foot to protect from a certain storm level, um, whereas another transect might need less just based on uh, the actual configuration of the dune and, and the shoreline. <clears throat> but um, we eventually end up with these reaches that, that we can that we can say when they have less than some amount of sand, it would be time to renourish. And we establish those triggers. You, I think you've already established some of those triggers for past coordination with FEMA and your engineer beat design. We would look at those again, maybe reevaluate those, and build those when do we need to nourish triggers into your uh, maintenance plan, which would then feed back to FEMA and document for them that it's an engineered beach that can get post-disaster funding, um, as, as you've explored already. Um, what that also lets us do is, is develop a long-term sand need I mentioned earlier, um, factoring in yearly and you know multi-yearly erosion rates, and then taking that all together, understanding how you provide. I should say here, the, the the overall philosophy is to provide equal protection along the beach. So we want to provide protection along the entire stretch to a certain level of storm and provide that equal protection to, to every area. It's not necessarily, in fact, it won't be equal sand. Some places will need more sand than others because of how the near shore contours work, how the wave, um, how the wave impacts are in that part of town versus other parts, whether it's a hot spot or not. <clears throat> so it wouldn't be equal sand, it'd be equal protection in, in the initial plan. And then distributing that out over time, what they'll let us do, John, if you go to the next slide, over time that lets us that lets us come up with a plan that's implemented over time. And this is an example from Carteret County where we had a, an overall nine-year nourishment cycle. You know, that some that over nine years, the entire stretch would be renourished at least once. And I think that's um, the, the blue reaches on screen are the ones that are more stable. So you can see sort of the, near the western end of the island and near the eastern end of the island, there are some areas that were a little more stable, didn't erode as quickly, and would only need to be nourished once every nine years if the rest of the plan is followed. The green would be areas that we know from the calculations and the modeling that we would do, that we did for them, that we would do for County Nagsad. We know those green areas would need to be nourished more frequently, they erode faster, um, and so those would be on a six-year cycle. And then there are a couple areas, in, in both banks anyway, that are hot spots and erode much more quickly and would need some sort of attention uh, in the form of nourishment every three years. Um, uh, overall, doing that lets us use, get the sand to the beach when it's needed um, and then strategizing this out lets you know when you need to be planning for nourishment in the future and doing it efficiently enough that you maintain that equal level of protection along the beach. Um, that's the plan. And as Johnny mentioned, we know there are um, more intense storms that occur from time to time and those need responses. So those would be uh, additional nourishments in addition to the plan, but setting the town up to qualify as a FEMA engineered beach lets you gain funding from FEMA for those events, whereas the, these long-term nine-year cycles would be um, built into the town's funding plan. Uh, hey, Brian, the other thing we're not showing here, just the, what I'll call Brian, uh, this is Mayor Cahoon. We have a question from one of our commissioners, from Commissioner Fuller. Okay. Uh, uh, Brian, I guess I, it's, it's a question not necessarily of you, but the board, which is under the number two, the master plan philosophy. Um, you talk about equal level of protection, not equal level of sand as a philosophical value. And is this your proposal or where did, where did that come from? Because I don't think we as a board have made that decision. Right, good question, and I appreciate you, you asking it and clarifying that. It's, it's been our philosophy. It's what we put into the Carter County uh, Bogue Banks Master Plan. It, it's kind of what we're using in, in um, the Oak Island area that we're working on a master plan for now. It, um, 
it's been a successful way of talking about it among multiple communities to try to understand you know, why you would place more sand more frequently in some spots than others. Just because the coastal processes drive some things to erode faster than others, then you end up needing more sand in some spots than others to keep the same effect. Um, if we talk uh, about it as we're giving everybody the same level of protection or benefit, that that lets you understand the benefit is, is equalized, but the amount of sand can be different. That, that would be something we would need to dis discuss, but at the same okay. point in time, um, do y'all do an analysis of a, a cost benefit or a point of uh, economic return or I don't know what you what you would call it, but yeah. then also as it relates to the financing part, would you agree that as we're looking at insurance and insurance all has the riders uh, for certain things. For instance, if you have health insurance and you're a smoker, you pay more for insurance. Um, if we have an area that we know that there's a huge amount of erosion, and I'm not just talking about hot spots, but particularly certain areas where, let's say you put four times as much sand in one area, then you do another area, are you gonna talk about the financing of how that should be shared? I, that is something we talked about. I'm gonna let Johnny actually answer that because he's been more into that personally than I have. Sure. and. Uh... Yeah, Commissioner Fuller. So yeah, what uh, what I would say on that is, um, you know, what when, and it, and it really, as you said, comes down to uh, a a a client decision on risk, really. So you know, just walking you back through this slide here. So the slide, the area to the left, shows you this, you know, cubic yards per foot that we estimate through modeling. And we come up with estimates to say, okay, in this area of the beach, if you want protection from a 25 year storm, you need, you know, 240 cubic yards per linear foot. If you want it for a 50 year, you might need 300. And, and that's what gets to this, you know, these graphs here on the right side is for, you know, you end up with separate reaches that have different requirements. And you, you're probably wondering why are these numbers different? Well, in these areas where the number is smaller, that would mean that there's probably a high dune there and uh, providing much more efficient storm protection, whereas this area that's at 266 might be have low dunes and might require more berm uh, fill that's not quite as efficient. It takes more berm fill than dune to provide the same level of protection. So that's why you end up with these, these numbers. But so what when we were going through this process with um, Carteret County and for each one of the towns, what we did was when we did this assessment, we said, okay, this is what it would take and this is the funding stream you would need to do to get up to a 50 year level storm protection and then what it would take to maintain it. And so we did this, you know, the decision was made as you're kind of alluding to in concert with the funding and they said, okay, based on the funding streams we currently have, we think we can provide protection up to a 25 year uh, storm level event. And we can maintain that over time in between the nourishment cycles. So yes, we but, would, go ahead. I'm just saying, so when we get your data, we have a, really an exercise to go to, to determine certain financing structures. I would think. Correct. Correct. Now, I will say at least there, they did not differentiate. I mean, their current funding streams, which are pretty much, you know, one, one district across the front of the beach and then the rest of the towns is kind of what they have. Uh, you know, that current setup was enough to maintain what they needed to do. So they did not look at varying it along the shoreline and having different reaches. But I mean, you could definitely do that if if the town decided to depending on you know what what the analysis shows and how much you know funding is needed for various areas you could definitely do that oh, thanks johnny yeah, i think we're back to the slide the places you were going to pick up anyway 
Okay. No, that's that, any more questions before we move on? I mean, we're fine to do this along. That's yeah, proceed. Okay. All right. So another thing, uh, of course, uh, one of the big benefits of going through this master plan is getting this 50 year authorization to do projects. So, you know, to kind of keep it simple, what we do is really the way I look at this is that we, the whole goal of this is setting up sand bank accounts that you can draw from over this 50 years. So, you know, the way we have set this up is uh, we have two bank accounts. We have your uh, background erosion bank account that we estimate. We have a storm erosion bank account that you estimate and we sort of ask for <coughs> authorization to dredge that over the next 50 years. And then what th we do is once we then have that uh, approval, what that allows us to do is then that when we want to do an individual action, we can get the permission to do that within what we call sort of a, uh, a, a letter a letter authorization that we ask for from the agencies and we send that off and the timeline of approval for those has been now in the order of 30 to 60 days uh, to do that. So uh, we still have to give them an event notification letter every time we want to do a project, but the, the timeline for approval for that is now much less. And as long as we kind of stay within those uh, guidelines that we set up uh, for the 50 year permit, uh, you know, we do not have to, you do not have to reopen sort of, you know, uh, negotiations with the, with the agencies, only if you were to kind of have to go outside of those boundaries and we kind of try to set those marks as, as wide as we can so that, you know, we can, we can, we can stay within them. So uh, we do have to, again, have these uh, event notifications, but again, they're pretty quick, which allows us to, you know, also then uh, plan, I mean, you, uh, the town of Mags has been able to do their stuff in the summer. So, uh, you know, it is, you're pretty, uh, been fortunate and for sure, as far as competition with dredge plants and other, and other, and other groups, but it's just getting where these dredge companies are just busy all the time. So the sooner you can get approvals, the sooner you can get things out on the street, it just should help with, uh, you know, getting the best possible prices that you can. Um, that leads to partnerships and funding. So again, one of the things we wanted to, you know, bring up is that we would see some value, especially in some of the areas of town that, you know, have been more historic hotspots. Again, we want to look at designing these nourishments to be sort of working with nature and maybe looking at feeder beaches and getting an understanding of how much you're losing along shore or, you know, along the beach versus cross shore going off and on. But, you know, we think that there's probably some value in uh, talking with other communities and seeing, okay, could we share some mode, demode cost uh, to hit, you know, hot spots in the various areas of these different towns, uh, rather than having to do, uh, you know, a large nourishment town wide just for really one area that's probably suffering. So again, all this is just trying to come up with a plan to use the available sand resources in your funds as efficiently and cost effectively as possible. And, you know, we want to just try to hit an optimal level of nourishment between, you know, volumes and timing. We don't want to undernourish. We don't want to overnourish. And uh, so, so, I mean, that's what we would be looking for. Uh, the good news, there does seem to be some additional funding streams, you know, coming up. Um, you know, the state has picked things up here. I mean, again, we all hope that once we're through this pandemic and uh, things can regulate a little bit that uh, that can continue to happen. Uh, FEMA is, you know, opening up some uh, pre-disaster mitigation funding, uh, new streams. We're talking to them to see if we can utilize those for sort of beach nourishment planning and projects. So uh, we, see, we see some now where the federal government's tended to be trying to get out of this business. We see them now looking like that there's a little bit more of an interest because they do see some of the storm protection benefits of it. Um, again, now getting toward the end. So uh, again, one of the other things that we do spend uh, a lot of time in a, uh, in a benefit of the master plan I've already kind of uh, hit on was the timing from event notification to bidding can now be greatly short, shortened. Uh, having preparedness for emergency needs. Um, 
you know, we were fortunate uh, on, well, I shouldn't say fortunate, but on uh, for Carteret County, we already kind of had a maintenance project that was planned. Um, Hurricane Florence happened. Uh, we were able to, since we had this master plan, we were able to modify it pretty quickly and uh, go ahead and get the approvals for that. So we had the plans and specs for the phase one project out uh, five weeks after the uh, event happened. So, uh, you know, that was a real benefit to, to be able to, you know, start work immediately, you know, through this master plan pro process. Again, the other thing with having Sam on board, uh, he spends a lot of his time maintaining the relationships he has with the dredging industry, you know, with all the players in those different fields, uh, because he knows them all. Uh, spends a lot of time following what the contractor schedules and their availability so that we can sort of uh, know when, when and what to do. And the other thing that he's been really helpful with and with us is going through our plans and specifications, looking at liquidated damage clauses and trying to hit uh, that nice um, medium or that nice uh, balance point of, you know, protecting the owner interest or protecting your interest as well as not making things so onerous to where you're just uh, having the contractor put a lot of risk dollars back to you in their bids. So uh, we do spend a lot of time in, in talking about that as well. So with that, that's what we had uh, prepared. I guess uh, we we're ready to uh, can uh, take any more questions and answers that the board may have. And just again, appreciate the opportunity to uh, present this information and uh, look forward to working with you. All right, thank you very much. Um, so I'll ask the board members any questions. No, oh, I'm not seeing any. Um, so thank you. Well, thank, thank you. you. We really, we really appreciate the opportunity, and, and are looking forward to, uh, and, and are honored to be working with the town of Nags Head. Look forward to it. Good to see you, Johnny. Yeah, good hey, to Johnny. see you guys too. One day, we're looking forward to being in person soon. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right, thank you. Um, uh, that brings us to um, full business item G2, which is discussion of 2020 fireworks. Who's, who's up? Anybody? I can share with you that we've confirmed with the uh, vendor that uh, you, your last opportunity to make a decision would be at the May 20th meeting. We'd have to have a firm um, decision to the vendor by May 29th. And your next scheduled meeting, the only one before that is May 20th. Are you still in the same mind? I'm trying. It breaks my heart because I love fireworks, even the illegal fireworks I love. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that's probably not politically correct, but I think this year we need to be cautious. We're getting ready to take a big step in reopening, and I know a lot of people derive probably further their business for the month of July, and I don't want to see anything happen that would cause that third to go away. And I think we need to be the adults in the room by discouraging stuff. Uh, social gatherings, mass gatherings, because we don't have enough police to stop a mass gathering no, of that don't. magnitude. Thank you. I, I just echo what Commissioner is going to say. It's sad. Um, it's, it's, it's sad, it's frustrating, but it's the only responsible thing to do. Fireworks, by its very nature, creates congregations of people. And we, I think we, if we haven't already adopted a philosophy of trying to meet the standards set by the feds and the state health people that know generally more than we do about this, then we should follow their guidance and not try to do something that would go against those health warnings. And I don't think we're going to be out of a situation mid-July that we can 
I think we should have a philosophy to practice social distancing, period. And this goes counter to that. It's not the fun thing to do, but that's sometimes our job's not to do the fun thing. Just the last thing he said, it's not the fun thing to do. I was thinking of a way to say it, and that's probably the, you know, the best way. Having, and I'm sure y'all seen it as well, but when we have him there at Nags at Pier, the, the, the tons of people that run around the pier on the beach, it's, it's everything but social distance. And I'm afraid that if we wait any longer, we may be caught in a spot where we have to pay for the fireworks if we don't, uh, we don't go ahead and make a decision. Again, it's not a popular decision, but uh, I agree with Commissioner Cookman. Here with everybody. You know, in all these control group meetings and everything, I tried to vote with my head and not my heart. <laughs> and I, I'm going to have a hard time not voting with my heart this morning. Uh, you know, you may get, you're probably going to get one dissenting vote from me just because it's just a, it's just a, that's a hard trick. And, you're all right. You're all correct. Those are and those are the hard decisions we've made as in the well, the hard recommendations we have made in the control group, which are to um, you know follow the health standards, follow the state and federal recommendations, um, uh, follow the science, do all the things that are right, um, mm -hmm. and and that is in fact what we should do um, in this case and. Um, So, uh, discussed. We don't have a motion on the floor. The motion would be? Mayor, I make a motion that we notify our vendor that we are canceling our July 4th, 2020 fireworks display. Thank you. Second? Second. So, motion and second. Any further discussion? And further notify our vendor that we are planning on celebrating in 2021 a return of fireworks. Maybe they will spend twice the money. <laughs> you now have a welcome back really right. a really big show. Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. <laughs> and I thank you for that. And I thank you for that indulgence. And I want the public to know that that was an indulgence. I understand what the right thing to do is and I don't I don't um uh, it was a very difficult decision. I appreciate what the, I didn't do that to grandstand or take, you, you know, put myself out there in a different way. I just, I, I needed to vote with my heart just once in this whole process here. So I appreciate that. Um, the um, next item on the agenda is discussion of the recycling program. Thank you. Um, at your last meeting, I discussed with you the status of the recycling program. I have a little bit more information at this meeting, but uh, I'm not sure it's going to change uh, the direction that recycling is going to go. Um, I share with you that there's a new vendor, RDS, um, that has a facility in Portsmouth that's relatively close to Wilbrader. Um, they, the, the reason I was unable to recommend that you enter into an agreement with RDS for them to collect our recyclables where there were several. Um, one of the biggest being that they're asking for a five-year commitment on their contract, um, which is a long commitment. Um, there, another reason is the contamination. Um, they, they did agree to move the contamination uh, for the load from 12% to 18%. Still feel like 18% is not high enough. Um, that's a concern. Um, and the fact that we have to have two separate contracts in order to haul the material to RDS is a, another concern. Monday, Bay's disposal met with RDS uh, to try and enter or, or at least discuss and potentially enter into an agreement whereby we would continue to contract for the delivery of recyclables straight through Bay. And I'd have to have a second contract. Um, what that would mean would essentially it would not change anything. We would just simply amend our contract um, that we presently have with Bay that would uh, direct them to start taking the material back to the recycler uh, and no longer uh, take it to Willibrator. And that that wouldn't have cost an impact. And that if I could, if that was something that was in place, then I would recommend to you 
you strongly consider recycling. Um, they, they're still two to three weeks away from potentially working that out, and I think we're at time is of the essence for us because the way I look at that, this is, is in a, a window of time, and that window of time is from now until uh, mid to late September. Uh, and we, you know, are with the uh, return of the visitors um, aft approach, and I think we need to make a decision on how we're going to address recycling. Um, the, the three options that I have in the packet, uh, the, the recycling, with the two contracts, if you, if you were to go that route, one with A, one with RDS, um, to start recycling again would be almost the exact cost that it would be for us to continue to incinerate with Willibrator, minus the concern about contamination. And I just I, I don't have uh, a, I don't have a sense of how much additional cost contamination could add. I feel like it will. Uh, if we have a contaminated load, that's going to add another hundred twenty-one dollars per ton. Um, we, we may be able to negotiate that, but again, we're kind of what it is. It's, it is what it is, and that's $121,000 for a contaminated load. Um, the, the other option is to continue um, with the contract to incinerate, and then the, the third option would be to suspend recycling. Um, and, and again, this is not something that I think our citizens would like to see us recycle. I, I, Echo what Commissioner Fuller said at the last meeting. I'm not going to say it as well as he did, but this is a this is a um, good example of where the finances of this, the economic parts of this, have maybe um, outweigh the, the public policy or the public sentiment. These two policies are rubbing against each other, uh, and it really comes down to a question of are we going to spend continue to spend $195,000 uh, to recycle or to incinerate? And, and it's hard for me to recommend that we continue to spend that those funds. But it is, it is something that I think we could view as a suspension. Um, I think I think I think the everything will be in place for you to pick this back up next May if you choose to do so. You already have a relationship with pay. You all, certainly already have plenty of enough recycling cans. Um, so. If, if RDS and Bay can work out an agreement where we can just contract straight with Bay and, Bay and take this, and they take the material, then that's something I think you should consider as the, as the economy returns. But at, at this point, I, I, I feel like your um, the best decision would be to suspend the recycling program at this time moving forward. If, if and then I'll, I'll leave it at that because there are some other things I think you need to consider uh, based on whatever decision you make now. All right. Thank you. Board members, any questions or discussion? Questions for Cliff? Motion would be in order. Correct. Right. Make a motion that we suspend recycling program to some future date to be determined. Or second. Second. Motion of second to suspend the recycling program to some future date. Um, and uh, fortunate that it didn't come together in time, but we are in a position where we, we need to make a decision and we are in a, a financial uh, or certainly at least uncertain potential waters at this point. Any discussion? I agree with what you're saying. And again, it's not the elimination of the program, it's strictly a suspension of the program. All right. Hearing none, we have a motion and second on the floor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? What are the other issues? So, so the other thing I, I need to ask for its consideration on is, is by not recycling or incinerating, what effect that has on our sanitation schedule. Ordinarily, we would starting May 1st, we'd be in the summer schedule. It didn't seem necessary. So we're starting the uh, summer schedule right now. It's planned for May 18th. 
and, and I'll go through each one of the routes to how this affects the, the blue route, which is um, primarily the, the uh, 12 and 12.43. I don't think it had an impact because we, we were collecting, recycling, and trash on the same day, Monday, Friday. So I think we can continue with our courses to pick up trash on those two days. Um, it gets a little more problematic when we go to the green route, which is the majority of the west side. We picked up trash on Tuesday, picked up recycling on Wednesday. I'm not sure it makes sense to pick up trash on back-to-back -back days. I, I know that's not going to be well received if we only pick up one day of trash in the summer. Um, the, uh, the everyone does have two cans, um, and we can pick up both of those cans on the same day, which I would recommend doing on Tuesday. Um, the, the the other option is if we wanted if we wanted they would continue to allow us to we could we could continue the west route with trash on Tuesday, recycling on Wednesday. And we carry the material to pay, and they'll charge us the same amount of $70 per ton. Um, but that gets confusing because part of your town is recycling, part of your town is not. So I recommend, and I think that's the first question I need guidance and direction on is how you want to handle the west side schedule. Throughout all the discussions we've had over all the years, through various iterations of boards. Um, board members have debated back and forth about it, and the public works director has sat and nodded this and the other and given guidance when questions were answered. Have you worked through any possible iterations of this with the public works director? Yes, ma'am. Has he given you guidance of what his philosophy would be? Because Ralph has been here since. <laughs> it's true. Um, yeah, and and we've asked, you know, when you when you double up, what you're doing is essentially is you're you're making for a very long day, and those are the discussions that we had. Is that can you pick up the entire west west side in one day? And, and uh, he feels like that would be would make more sense, more efficient than to pick up two days in a row. But would it make more sense to do since we're not really theoretically doing recycling? Having two days of garbage pick up what we did before we started this recycling method? It, it, yes, it probably does. But at this point, what would that second day be? And, and any day you pick is going to throw off the oh rest God. of the schedule. Yes. I don't have a solution. I'm not going to offer a solution. I think that that's an internal. We're not the experts, no matter what we think we are. We're not. But the people that do it every day are the ones that I think can give us the best guidance. And we've talked about that further is that, you know, the question then becomes what if there's four guys that then would not have trash to pick up on Wednesday and what would they do? And there are plenty of other things that we could um, direct them to do, maybe even working with facilities maintenance to deal with um, cleaning up trash in the town, making sure the carts are have the wheels and have the lids, and there, there's other work we could direct them to do. Like, uh, yeah. I, they are the experts, and I, yeah, but <laughs> over the years, too, decisions made that were that forced their hand. Uh, that, you know, but it, it seems to me that. Everybody has enough cans at this point that they ought to be able to get rid of their trash in the day. The, the only issue is if you forget, which some of us elderly people do. Um, but but I'm, I'm totally fine with one day a week on the west side, personally, um, if they pick up green and blue at the same time. I would hate to see two trucks come and pick up one pick up a green and one pick up a blue. Yeah. That just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if it's if I've got a problem and I forgot to put something out, I know where I can take it. And, and I forgot to mention, I think I guess it's assumed that the blue we treat all the cans the same. They're all trash. Yep. Yeah. 
group one dash, we do have enough cans. And I agree that's an in-house decision. We don't run those routes. We're not there. We don't know the time management. Yes. I think it's time to trust our time. Thank you. Very good. That concludes my won't go to the red route then. All right. <laughs> very, very good. Thank you. Um, and one thing, I, one more, just to be clear, we'll, we'll we, if the board agrees, we will continue to contract with Bay for the roll-off site here when it public works, when it's here at the town hall, so that people that want to continue recycling can continue recycling. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, offer those sites. That is it a, a fairly nominal expense. Thank you. Make sure you get with the property managers as quickly as possible to let them know for their guests you know, they could put something in the house because the guests might not still understand and they might have instructions in the houses about how to do garbage. And those aren't going to be the same. Um, the next item on our agenda are committee reports. Does it, do any uh, board members have a committee report to make? I'll make a quick one. Um, and the Tourist Bureau, the Grants Committee at the Tourist Bureau recommended a certain amount of grants beyond the money that's available, uh, which is typical. Uh, the first cycle, the Grants Committee recommended spending about over 55%, which left 45%. The Grants Committee was re uh, created said no we still think we should honor so we went over budget which is typical in the recommendation that was before the pandemic the pandemic hit the full board met and said no we're stopping we're cutting back we're not doing a number of things so those grants were sent back to the grants committee to get down, so we're going to, we're, a lot of people aren't going to get the grants they thought they were going to get. That being said, um, we meet tomorrow. But that being said, like fireworks are not in the normal grant committee review. But it'd be interesting if other people are going to do the same thing that we do with fireworks. And then we could, I'm not sure legally we can, but I think we could apply those grants to the grants committee. And all I'm just saying is two things. One, from a permission standpoint, I'd like to tell them that next it's not going to apply for the firework grant and that if there's any way to move the money over to fully fund the grant we already recommended, I would like to do that. That's just a report. Um, I will tell you, it came across an, an email uh, uh, and is therefore official. I think it's on Air Town website at this point. That reentry for visitors is at 1201 a.m. on the 16th. Thank you. Thank you. The other reports you guys haven't met, the PO folks. No, they, he did talk about having a. Uh, a meeting a zoom meeting sometime here in the future he gave us a list of possible topics i'll be following up on this okay. yeah, thank you i would like to i know this is not the appropriate time thank you for all the leadership you've shown on this program you've given the board good information you've given our citizens good information and we all appreciate it thank you appreciate that um i hope we're coming into the short runs here <laughs> um, the next item on our agenda is consideration of board committee appointments. Um, you have that before you, and I believe part of that report is that all of those who are um, in the position of being replaced are interested in continuing the point of information. 
I'd like to make a motion to reappoint Dave Elder to the planning board. Thank you. There is a second. Second. Second to reappoint Dave Elder to the planning board. Um, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Well, next would be Board of Adjustment. Make a motion that we reappoint Don Milbrath to the Board of Adjustment. There's a second. second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Next is the Personnel Grievance Board. I'll make a motion that we appoint Dean Flanagan as an alternate to the personnel grievance panel. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. A motion and a second to appoint Gene Flanagan as an alternate to the personnel grievance panel. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. I make a motion that we reappoint Annette Ratzenberger and Rose Lay. The Fireman's Relief Fund. Right. I have a motion and a second to reappoint Annette uh, Ratzenberger and Burns Lay to the Fireman's Relief Fund Board. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. And, and uh, if any of them are listening, we express our gratitude to all of you for your willingness to continue to serve. Um, in those positions. We appreciate that very much. Uh, the next item would be items from the town attorney. Mr. Lighting. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, since I'm going to talk for a few minutes, I'm going to move over here so I can see most of you, even though I'm still behind a couple of you. Um, wanted to bring to your attention uh, some uh, very recent legislation that uh, deals with ability to have uh, remote meetings uh, or electronic meetings. Uh, I want to first point out that this is not such a meeting as defined by this new act. It's a very narrow um, law that was adopted by the legislature over the weekend and signed by the governor on Monday. That's how new this is. Based on a bill that was drafted and um, uh, uh, even before it was circulated to a committee, it was circulated amongst some attorneys groups uh, as uh, beginning two weeks ago, so it's very, very new. But um, it does um, allow for electronic meetings or remote participation in meetings by local governments um, under certain circumstances in one uh, set of facts, and that is when the governor or the legislature has declared a state of emergency. It is not broad enough to, um, to authorize such meetings when there's just a local state of emergency. An emergency that's been declared. Um, but in any event, the current circumstances we have right now would allow for uh, such an electronic or remote uh, meeting. Um, the good news is that even though the board <laughs> is not currently con uh, participating in such a meeting, if you were, you would be in compliance with all of these requirements uh, that are brand new and have just been proposed even, after, uh, even um, subsequent to when this meeting was put together. Uh, so I think it's very, I think it's good that the town is already uh, going above and beyond what is required and is in compliance with most all of the provisions of this uh, law already. This is really significant because, as, we, uh, as I believe you may have discussed at the um, uh, special meeting you had back in um, March, um, it's unclear uh, whether a local government, either a county or a municipality, has the authority to conduct meetings with members participating through remote or electronic means. Um, partly uh, that's a result of language in the statute that speaks to a quorum being made up of those who are physically present in the, in the council chambers. But this law is designed to broaden that um, and to allow a body to meet with members, including all the members, participating through only electronic means. Now, the way this is defined in this act um, is that uh, remote participation uh, occurs when the members of the, of the board are, are participating only through simultaneous electronic communication. So you all are physically present together. So that's why this is not such a meeting, even though I think 
we anticipated that a meeting of this nature with the public was not allowed, but um, but it's being broadcast to the public and the public is allowed to participate remotely, uh, that that might be the kind of thing that needed to be addressed by special legislation. But, um, just a couple of, of key features about this that I do want to talk about. Um, this, this would allow, in the event where we have a subsequent emergency declared by the governor or the legislature, um, or a subsequent meeting of this body during the, the existing declaration to have one or more of the members of this board not physically present with each other and participating solely through remote means. So that if someone can only call in or participate through Zoom or some other uh, uh, audio uh, and video platform, that would now be permissible. Uh, this legislation also is broad enough to allow um, the quorum to be made up of people who are participating remotely. It allows for public hearings to be conducted. Uh, well, we've had public hearings in this meeting today, I, I believe you know, this, the legislation doesn't control this particular meeting, um, but you have allowed folks to participate uh, in, by the greatest means possible. Interestingly, this new legislation also requires a pretty public hearing that's conducted through remote participation of the board members that you will allow a public comment to be submitted up to 24 hours after the public hearing has concluded. I don't know what the purpose of that requirement is since it doesn't require that you delay taking action. So I don't know why they built into the legislation a requirement that you allow a comment after you've already taken action following a public hearing. I'm not so sure that that was as well thought out as they intended, but um, you can also conduct quasi-judicial proceedings and closed sessions uh, through uh, these kinds of remote meetings. Um, one thing that um, uh, that is required when you have those types of meetings, remote participation meetings, is that all votes must be by roll call vote only. Um, again, I think that's so that everyone knows exactly how people are voting. In addition, in the situation where somebody has been participating remotely and then um, uh, is no longer uh, participating in the meeting, um, but is still in, is still connected, um, they will be treated just the same as if they were present for a meeting and left the meeting room without being excused, meaning that any matter that comes before the board and is voted on, they would be considered as a vote in favor of that kind of motion. But if they're not connected? If they are connected, but not participating. They Let's participate, say they, they chose to push the off button. Yeah. So, only, only during the period of time during which the simultaneous communication is maintained. So they can push the off button and then they're not counted as a yes vote. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Um, uh, one final thing on it uh, that I think is interesting is that um, uh, it becomes, it, it's, 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 it's carefully worded to uh, become effective immediately, but also to indicate that it is not designed to and shall have no effect on electronic meetings that have been conducted prior to when this law was adopted. So, um, again, I think that's designed to protect those organizations that have been meeting remotely during the last couple months of this declaration of emergency, even before this legislation was adopted. But, um, so in the event we have those kinds of meetings in the future or a meeting where any one of you has to participate remotely during the state of emergency or any subsequent state of emergency declared by the governor or the legislature, we will have some special rules in addition to those that we follow today um, uh, imposed, again, with respect to voting and some other things. So just wanted to make sure you all were aware of this since it's brand new and it may well have an impact on some of our meetings. Uh, John, I, I saw, I read this yesterday and then uh, and thought about this morning's meeting and then promptly forgot. Um, should, today we have conducted roll call votes. I don't think that's required because you're all physically present together. Okay. Got it. If, you, if any one of you had called in, then in that event, yes, um, you would have needed to conduct the, the votes by roll call vote in that, in that situation. Okay. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Thank you. Uh, next item are items from the town manager. Yes, sir. Two things. First, uh, I wanted to um, walk the board through three things that um, were affected by manager proposal. Well, summer, the manager proposal, the 
coronavirus and uh, social distancing. I won't go over the memo in your packet entirely, but I will just start with Ocean Rescue. And um, when we when we originally started looking at budget cuts at the time, we weren't anticipating. We certainly weren't in, anticipating that our visitors would be coming back to the earliest May 16th. Um, so at that time, I, was, I, I believe I told the board there would be about a hundred thousand dollars in salaries for lifeguards. Um, we're not going to be able to do that if we're going to uh, maintain adequate ocean rescue lifeguard services because um, we could be looking at um, near capacity on some days that we that we traditionally see, at least by the uh, first of July anyway. So, so presently we have 30 employees, 30 lifeguards that have been hired. Uh, traditionally we carry 45 ocean rescue guards. We have 16 still that we are waiting to find out whether or not they're going to be permitted to come if um, June 15th if the restrictions for J-1 visa students are lifted. Um, those 16 would be able to come and get trained up pretty quickly and be ready um, to provide service this summer. What, what that means is we've got, we're going to start this summer off with 21 guards on the beach. Um, we, we have traditionally maintained 15 stands. Uh, we're only going to, at this time, maintain 10 of those stands. Um, those five that, at this time, and that doesn't mean they won't, they won't come online at some point. Um, but those are at Albatross, uh, Hollowell, Town Hall, Ida Street, and Limulus Street. Um, and this, when I'm, the enforcement part of all of this, for each one of these items, I have confirmed with uh, Ocean Rescue Captain, uh, Police Chief, and Fire Chief, that Public Works Director, everyone that has a part in this, um, that they will, that they recognize what I'm about to tell you, and they have uh, confirmed that the message I'm telling you is the message they're telling their staff. Um, one of the things that I think drives us all crazy is if a um, staff person says more about that tent than I could get. That's not what is going to be communicated. Um, and I've made sure of that, that that's been uh, confirmed with our staff. Um, Ocean Rescue Lifeguards will have some responsibility when it comes to sharing the message of social distancing. Um, as it stands right now, um, the social distancing is still in place, and that may continue through the summer. I don't know about the crowds of 10, um, but the message is that uh, they're going to when I say enforced, they're going to communicate clearly that you're expected to maintain six feet of separation. They're not supposed to gather in crowds of bigger than 10. Um, we've got some social distancing signs that we're going to place at each one of the beach accesses. Uh, these signs will be universal. Thankfully, each the uh, Dare County is working with each of the municipalities to come up with a sign that same sign you'll see at Kitty Hawkins, the one you'll see um, in Nags Head. Um, we're, we're going to treat these, the Ocean Rescue staff the same way we have other staff. We're going to help screen them in the morning and in the evening after their shifts to make sure they're staying healthy. Um, they're all provided with CPR masks so that they they don't have to worry about um, the, the mouth to mouth. Traditionally, they can do chest compressions. They can use the bags. Um, they're they're going to need to adhere to this it, it, with the but the apprentice program, it's, it's, uh, it's not uncommon to have two. And then we have roving lifeguards. It's not uncommon to see two guards in a stand. But I don't think we're going to be able to do that this year because, you know, just if, if we have to practice what we preach, if, if we're telling people to uh, not be six feet from one, one another, then they can speak to each other one up and one down. Um, so that's. I, got, I want to also talk about uh, tents on the beach and social distancing further than uh, just the lifeguards. But if you have any questions about ocean rescue specifically, I'm happy to answer those now. Plus, I see that um, of our 16, 16 of our 20 GJ1 students, um, six of them already said they can't wait until June 15th, date, so they're looking in other areas. Right. So they have 16 that. Uh, we think we'll still be able to come. If it goes past June 15th, it reaches a point where it's just not good for them more of. Well, we can't make it work financially. 
Yeah. You know, these are cost vary from country to country, and currently, right now, of course, nobody can get a visa appointment because of the uncertainty. Nobody wants to spend money to um, make a visa appointment right now. That's, once you make that appointment, that money is gone. We have some, some, we may be able to increase, supplement those numbers with some part time guards. Uh, they're all part time, but it would work uh, as needed. We have several that have moved on and no longer are working the duration of the summer, but we, they have expressed interest in coming back to filling where we need it. And we also possibly reached out to uh, some of the university swim team to see if any other people may be interested in. Chad does a good, thorough job, but I'll make sure that it reached out to those. I don't know if he has or he hasn't, but I can well, I suggest that. A lot of students don't have summer employment right now. Right. Well, uh, just a couple of things quickly. Um, I know you mentioned, I call them bladders, but do we actually have those bladders for, yes. it, it's, a, it's a plastic insert and you manually do the bladder for the CPR? Um, do we have that? And then there's the whole technique now of CPR without any blowing anyway. But I would wonder if we have the proper equipment and then another second question after that. Okay. Um, yes, all, all cars have med kits at the stands and on the bikes. Um, and they have CPR uh, masks. All supervisors have bag belt masks. Um, and then each lab card has their own personal pocket, maybe what you're referring to, but they have their own CPR mask. I guess it's just in a, a small container, but they call them bags. But they... Okay. The, the, the next question is, is that during a rescue, um, I think they're called buffs, but certain lifeguards are wearing these things where they're around their neck. And when they go on a rescue, it just pulls up and covers their face. Do we have proper, like, you know, it's hard to do social distancing when you're rescuing somebody, but there are protective measures you can take, and there are these uh, things that, that they can wear around their neck that they can pull up so that they don't have face-to-face -face contact yes. with somebody. The, uh, I want to call the police chief fire chief recognize those gators, I think, is another name for those that we're, uh, we're going to purchase. I want to do everything we can for the lifeguards because they're going to be you know, EMTs are there, um, but we don't have to worry personally about the EMTs. The lifeguards are on that first line and firefighters, and we got to have the necessary equipment. I mean, the thing we're doing this year as part of their training is um, going through some de escalation exercises and how they may, you know, they're going to be confronted with uh, concerns that they haven't had to be confronted with in the past. Not everyone's going to like to hear the message that they're going to be. Uh, communicating, and so we want to train them in how to handle that until they can get to that. I think that we would also provide those buffs or gators or whatever to all of our front line people that are out and about. Everybody's going to have interactions. Um, with Tents on the Beach, we're going to uh, continue the program that we had in the past, and I'll just kind of walk through it. The uh, lifeguards on Sunday, as they're coming off the beach, they're going to tag all the tents that are on the beach. Um, tags that we've used in the past that um, explain that no items may be left on the beach overnight. We are adding, in the past, it just it was more of an advisory, but to this, to the tag this year, we're adding that they are subject to removal. From that items left on the beach overnight will be removed. Um, so Sundays, the guards will tag those. Monday morning, the uh, um, facilities maintenance will start at 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, one crew, one individual will start at 8th Street, one will start at um, Ramp 1 and work their way to where they join somewhere in the middle. Um, they'll, and they'll remove those items that have been tagged uh, and those and any items that are out that haven't been tagged, we'll tag those. So every day there's a tagged item on the beach, it's going to get removed. Um, you know, that's the general schedule that they work. It, 
there are areas that they need to concentrate in more than they may do that if if um, there's a concentration of tents here at Town Hall, and they will probably adjust their schedules as, as need be. Um, those items are treated as trash. We don't keep those to be handed out later. Um, and we have uh, permits that we issue to our tent vendors, our concierge services, um, that will continue to do that. Uh, we sent a letter to, we will be sending a letter to all those tent vendors reaffirming the rules and their expectation to live by those rules, requiring them to pick up their permit, sign off on their permit that um, they have, that we know they have that in hand. Um, and we'll continue to, that'll be the schedule and that'll be the route we take to deal with tents, items of tents and chairs left on the beach. Really, there's not much else to add to the social distancing. We're, we're um, everyone's going to be responsible for carrying that message. Um, you know, like Commissioner Fuller said, it's going to be primarily on ocean rescues uh, back to, to do that. So the ones that are out there the most, we will have police officers out there every day. Uh, they'll be responsible for enforcement, and I don't, we're we're going to do our absolute best to get to convince people that it's the right thing to do. And, them to adhere to that rule. Um, the last thing we want to do is issue any citations. Yeah. But on the other side, if we have a guest who gets out of line with somebody and does something that, that crosses the line, shoves them, we pop <laughs> all, all the way. <laughs> Commissioner Brinkley could probably attest to this. Usually in those situations, they, it wasn't the social distancing. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm sure. Yes. Um, There's usually some other circumstance. Yes. That, that's all I have on that. My, my other is a request for a post session to discuss personnel matter uh, in accordance with General Statute 143-318.11A6. Well, um, since we um, are only have left the board agenda for my agenda at the appropriate time uh, let, let's um, let's cover those um, so board of commissioners does anybody have any items commissioner fuller mr brink yes sir mr sears yes um, our visitors have started our non-resident property owners have started coming back several states either have never practiced them um, wearing masks and they're coming into an area and i really appreciate what did about um, putting out the alert. I thought that was really smart. Um, we need to reinforce that. And I would suggest that perhaps the Chamber of Commerce alert all its members about the need for their employees to wear masks, as well as notify all of their visitors coming in to wear masks. And that we do the same with our Facebook page and our um, website. Um, Morgan is encourage social distancing and wearing a mask, the better we have a chance of stopping the extra spread of any possible cases. Um, and the other thing is, um, I'd like to thank the community for their strong anti-response to that anonymous letter that's so vile. People don't have the courage to put their name on it. They shouldn't be, have the um, ability to just put it out. That is not a sentiment of this community, and it needs to be vehemently condemned as it has been. And I say we do. That's not who we are as a community, um, and the character of that letter does not define us as a community. Absolutely. Yeah. Ma'am. Yes, sir. I've, I've talked to several people who have not gotten that emergency broadcast. Ah, okay. I'll see if I can figure out why. On Verizon. You know what? They're on Verizon. I'm on Verizon and I haven't gotten it. So, so uh, do you know? Verizon and I got it. So are you do doing you? it every day? Yes. Because I have. Um, I don't know. We're do we were. I know we were doing it on the reentry days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I don't know if we were doing it Tuesday, and Thursday. Okay. Cause I got one on Monday, and I thought they were doing it more than one time a day. Yeah, yeah. I got one on Monday, but it never came out again. I got one I've had another one. Yeah. Yesterday was the, the 911 was down. I didn't get one. Sorry, for free entry. Yeah. Oh, 
By the time you sent the email, I had not gotten one. I have gotten one since then. Okay. Do you have to know what kind of devices they were, they were, but they were on Verizon Network? Thank you. Um, I have one item that's not on, not here. Um, uh, there's some discussion. I, the governor's um, the governor hasn't changed the situation for restaurants. Right now, they're still only takeout. I guess there's the potential on the 22nd that he may change that and allow reduced capacity dining of some kind. And so there's been some discussion um, about. If the flexibility is there and what the governor offers, if, if uh, dining establishments could establish outdoor dining, and essentially, if, you're, if you have your allocated number of seats inside and you eliminate half of them in order to achieve the distancing, you still have the parking and you still have the wastewater for the full number of seats, can you go outside and put picnic tables or other kinds of outside tables for outside dining up to whatever number you were permitted for. And um, as a way to help the restaurants yeah, with their with their business. Um, and in the face of, of those restrictions. And so I wanted to ask whether the board was had any interest. We would have another meeting um, May the 20th, we're going to have a meeting for a budget meeting May the 20th anyway, which would be before the May 22nd. Are, are we interested in perhaps receiving some recommendations from staff about whether they could do that and how that could be done the May meeting? I am. I, have you seen a draft letter from the Restaurant Association yeah. yet? Yeah, I, okay. I forwarded an email that can't contain that to y'all, yes. Okay. That'd be a good starting point. I would suggest that, I thought that was a great starting point that you just said, but um, that letter also referenced allowing those restaurants have food trucks to open them in their parking lot. Um, that would be a very good alternative as well yes. to we, look at. Can we allow that? We do. We do. We do. But I guess the letter was written more not every town does that. Yeah, that's correct. They don't, but Michael had a con excuse me, Michael had a conversation with him, I authored that letter mm -hmm. and I don't think he recognized some of the things that they are permitted to do here. But they're they're already talking about other ways that we might be able to help restaurants that don't have a food truck. Um and then he carried that a step further and reached out to some uh, members of the business community because I imagine retail is gonna want they have restrictions on them as well. They they may want to uh be able to look at ways that they can also um, do business differently. So we are making those contacts. And I encourage anyone listening that would to reach out to the planning department so we can hear from them what we might be able to do to help with this. Good. Thank you. Um, that was the only thing that I had. Um, so is there any other business to come before the board? Okay. Any other business? In that case, the motion to uh, for the closed session would now be in order. So moved. I have a motion to have a second. And this is for discussion of personnel in accordance with General Statute 143-318.11A6. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. The board will be in closed session. <laughs> Uh, we've already uh, covered all of the other agenda items, including other business, so a motion to adjourn would be in order. No, that's a separate meeting. That's a separate meeting. I asked that because I didn't want to make that mistake today, so I asked that question. Uh, well, uh, that, that. This is the mid-month meeting is a recess it's a workshop. It's right. a workshop. No, no, no. It's you can recess on the workshop. Okay. You're it's 9 o'clock. You all sit at 9 o'clock that day.
So it is a recess. Okay. So we will recess to the May 20th meeting. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed?